She had asked him for the autograph. He went over there to sign it, and then she said that she wanted more than that, so he tore up the autograph and threw it. Welcome back to Port TV. I'm June Grasso. What started as a simple request for an autograph has turned into a full-blown court case with former child star Gary Coleman facing charges of battery. According to the alleged victim, Tracy Fields, Coleman punched her after she made a comment about his attitude, stopping him from becoming an adult actor. She started a civil suit against Coleman and is seeking about $1 million. But Coleman insists that Fields started the physical altercation and that he was merely defending himself. We're going to go live into that courtroom in just a few moments. I'd like to introduce our guest commentator. His name is Adam Buckman, and he is a TV columnist with the New York Post. He's been covering the radio and television industry as a reporter since 1982. He's a worked for the electronic media as a New York bureau chief and a reporter, and he was a TV editor for the New York Post. He knows a great deal about child stars and Gary Coleman in particular. Adam, is there something different about Gary Coleman because he was a child star that makes him subject to these kinds of harassments? I think so. Gary, um, of all the child stars that have made headlines in the last few years with their troubles, Gary, Gary Coleman may be uh, one of the biggest. At the height of different strokes, um, he could be seen tap dancing with Bob Hope on NBC specials. And uh, the show was so big that Nancy Reagan came on the program to promote her anti-drug message. Different Strokes was a big phenomenon, and Gary Coleman, from a very young age, from when he was first discovered at age five, was a very precocious, very talented, very extroverted child. And um, he had natural charm, a natural cuteness, and Different Strokes ran for so long that, that he's really a, a beloved figure for those who grew up watching him in the early 80s. And just briefly, do you, there's a support group by Paul Peterson who is mm -hmm. at the Donna Reed show yes. of four child actors. Do they really need a support group? Paul Peterson has done a great service starting a group called A Minor Consideration. He uh, starred as a child on the Donna Reed show. And uh, to put it in perspective, I don't think most former child stars get in trouble or have uneasy uh, uh, young adulthood and that kind of thing, but enough of them do that there seems to be a pattern of, of problems. And, and Paul has started a group that, that, that reaches out to, to the child stars and, and, and helps them. And I think he's probably doing a very good thing. His heart is in the right place. Well, we're going to hear more about it from you in a little while, but let's go into the courtroom. Jeff Lewin, the prosecutor, is describing the altercation from the prosecution's point of view. Yeah. And she jumped over and she grabbed Mr. Coleman. She pulled him off Miss Fields. Now, you'll meet Miss Waters also, and you'll see she is, she is definitely much bigger than the defendant. And she'll tell you that although she didn't have trouble pulling him off, she had a little trouble keeping him separated because the defendant continued to go after Miss Fields. And at one point, Miss Fields, who remained the entire time over here by the gumball machine, at one point she came back and, to get her purse. Give me my purse. She walked over and she tried to grab her purse. Mr. Coleman again tried to go after her, and Ms. Waters will tell you she had to hold him back, and he pushed against her. At that point, Ms. Fields walks over to the phone, with the phone she'd been on, this fax machine. She tells Mr. Coleman, all right, that's it, you're in trouble, I'm calling the police. She gets on 911, she calls the police. You're going to hear the 911 tape, you're going to hear Ms. W Ms. Uh, Fields' actual statements from that time as basically just after it occurred, and as Mr. Coleman is at first pacing around the store, and then he leaves. Before he leaves, before the 911 call is even completed, when he knows Ms. Fields is on the 911 call, he makes a couple statements to her. He makes a derogatory statement about Ms. Fields, and then he walks out and he says, if the police want me, they're going to have to catch me, and he leaves. Now, a few moments later, the police actually arrive. And police take statements from all of the individuals that were present. And they take a look at Miss Fields, and they notice some swelling under her eye, uh, redness. Nothing too bad, but a little bit of an injury under her right eye. 
and they ask her if she needs medical attention, and I believe an ambulance may have shown up at that point. Ms. Fields will tell you that she was in such shock or, or just wasn't herself at that point, declined medical attention, wanted to get home to her family, wanted to get out of there. As she continued to speak with the police, Ms. Jones, the manager of the store, watched her and said, you know what, you look like you need some help, let me call an ambulance again. Another ambulance is called, they treat her at the scene, she's taken RFK and treated there, released. No significant injuries. I'm not going to tell you she was, no broken bones, it was just basically a black eye and some pain. That is what occurred that day, July 30th. That is what we're here for. Now you're going to hear some more evidence in this case about subsequent events, things that happened after that day. And you're going to hear from Ms. Fields that the next day or a couple days later, she actually heard some reports about Mr. Coleman that uh, she had heard either statements on the news or something about this incident. She spoke to a friend about this and her friend told her she should talk to an attorney. And she'll tell you, she contact, contacted an attorney, a man by the name of Robert McNeil. She went in, she spoke with Mr. McNeil, and after this, this meeting, a lawsuit was filed. And you're gonna hear about this civil suit. Ms. Fields will tell you that she okayed a civil suit. She wasn't, no amount of money was discussed. She wasn't really privy to writing the complaint or knowing the amount of the complaint, but that she okayed a lawsuit. A lawsuit was filed by Mr. McNeil. This was filed probably a couple days later. I believe August 3rd is the date of the, of the lawsuit. It's gonna hear about that. You're also gonna hear that after that day, Ms. Fields appeared on a couple of TV shows. She appeared on Lisa, she appeared on, I believe, Mother Love, and maybe a news conference. But she's made some statements since this case, and she's told her story a few different times. The incident we are here on is what happened on July 30th, what happened between about 11.30 and 12 on that date. I'd ask you to listen to the testimony of the witnesses. Listen to what they have to say about what happened there. And I've got no doubt, if you focus on that, you'll find the defendant guilty as charged. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lowen. Uh, Mr. London. This will be Adam London, the defense attorney for Gary Coleman, whom you see sitting there to the right. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. <coughs> Uh, this uh, portion of the trial, the opening statement, uh, is for us uh, as advocates uh, to uh, express to you what we believe the evidence is going to show. Uh, what I'm telling you now and what uh, Mr. Lewin had just expressed to you uh, is not evidence in this case. Uh, this is to give you an idea uh, of what is going to come. As you can imagine, in any case, as had been responded to some of the questions in voir dire by some of the jurors, uh, you expect uh, in a matter which is in court to hear more than one side uh, of a story. Uh, this case uh, shall be no exception. Uh, in listening to Mr. Lewin in his opening statement, uh, you heard him use words of shock, it being surreal, things being sudden. And I think that uh, you will hear in this case uh, people describing those emotions and you will hear how it affected their perceptions uh, in being able to uh, articulate uh, or being able to articulate here in court now before you uh, how they recall uh, the order of events. Uh, I expect that you will hear in this trial uh, that uh, this is a case uh, which was, uh, in essence, fueled uh, by the fervor uh, of Ms. Tracy Fields. Uh, you will all have an opportunity to observe her here in court. You'll all have an opportunity uh, to watch her testify on the stand and to look uh, at the quality and character of her testimony. Uh, you will learn uh, that this case uh, did not begin as one might expect. Uh, with uh, the police uh, arresting somebody who's going to be charged uh, with a, a criminal uh, complaint. Uh, 
Uh, this is a case which was fueled and perpetuated by Ms. Fields. Uh, you will learn that Ms. Fields uh, had prepared a a citizen's uh, arrest form, uh, which you will learn was completed in blank, uh, which she had just uh, executed by signing. Uh, you will learn that subsequently uh, she had uh, signed a uh, criminal complaint, uh, not a complaint, uh, being prepared uh, by the uh, prosecutor's office, uh, but a complaint uh, that she signs uh, in blank. Uh, you will learn, uh, as Mr. Lewin described, that these events had occurred on uh, July 30th, 1998. Uh, and as I had mentioned, that uh, you will expect uh, in any matter uh, which is being litigated, uh, there to be uh, different sides of a story uh, and conflicts uh, in what we expect uh, to be sh shown. Uh, you will see uh, that uh, Ms. Fields did not uh, contact a friend uh, some days later. Uh, after this incident had taken place, and that friend had either directed her or recommended that she should seek out counsel uh, as it relates to a civil case. Uh, but you will learn uh, that probably the same day that this had happened, uh, she had contacted and spoken uh, at length uh, to an attorney. Uh, you will learn uh, that a, a complaint uh, was prepared in full, completed, uh, not several days, not a week uh, after this incident had taken place but that a uh, complaint had been filed uh, by her attorney, had actually been completed uh, on uh, July 31st. So this is after a discussion would have taken place with her and her attorney, uh, after the time uh, would have been uh, involved to prepare uh, a, a complaint uh, against an individual. It was completed by January 30, by July 31st. <clears throat> You will learn uh, that, uh, that the complaint uh, which was filed uh, seeks damages. It seeks damages in excess of $1 million. And you will learn that uh, uh, the plaintiff alleged in the complaint that at the time that this must have been prepared, which was before the date that it was signed on July 31st, so probably the same day that the incident took place, alleging uh, loss of earnings, alleging time away from employment, alleging severe uh, and uh, uh, tragic emotional and uh, uh, mental distress. This is significant with respect to uh, the motivations uh, behind uh, the information that was conveyed uh, by Ms. Fields. You will learn that uh, the physical stature of my client is perhaps uh, four feet, four and a half feet uh, tall. Uh, you will see the uh, physical stature uh, of Ms. Fields, uh, which uh, somewhere in the na neighborhood of uh, five feet, uh, nine inches, uh, in excess of uh, 200 pounds. Uh, my client at the time was approximately 86 pounds. And you will learn uh, with respect to uh, the sequence of events uh, you will hear uh, a much different portrayal of Ms. Fields, uh, one which is uh, rude, loud, discourteous, and as uh, Mr. Lewin had described to you on, during his opening statement, uh, you will hear uh, conversations back and forth, uh, which began with uh, Ms. Fields uh, requesting an autograph. Uh, from Gary, and that Gary had graciously uh, walked uh, from the area where uh, he had been near the register to Miss Fields, and he retrieved a pen, and he signs an autograph, and he, be, and he walks away. And at some point, uh, that some comment then comes out by Miss Fields. But can't you do something else? Can't you make it better? And there was a colloquy which then began, which, well, why isn't that good enough? You know, what, what are you going to do with it? 
and then there becomes a uh, the the communications, the discussions uh, becomes uh, louder and more heated, and you will hear uh, insults uh, on both parts uh, being lobbed uh, by Tracy uh, to Gary, and from Gary to Miss Fields, and you will hear uh, that uh, after. Uh, these insults, uh, communications uh, had uh, been exchanged between both, that Gary then walked back over to where Miss Fields was for the purpose of retrieving the autograph and ripping it up because he didn't feel she deserved it. And he throws it away. And at that point, regrettably, makes some comments. Uh, to Miss Fields, but you will hear in the course of this litigation that at that point, Gary uh, was scared, and he can tell you uh, that he was being crowded uh, by Miss Fields, and that he believed that she was going to jump on him. Uh, acting reasonably uh, under. Uh, that situation, he instinctively reacted to protect himself. Uh, I know uh, that after you've heard all of the testimony in this case, and after you review the law uh, that the court uh, gives you, uh, that uh, you will find uh, Gary uh, not guilty, and that you will acquit him of these charges. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. London. Your first witness, please, Mr. Wong. Thank you. People call it Emily Waters. Bill, could you get Ms. Waters? Call Ms. Waters. Very short and to the point opening statements, and I'm going to ask our guest commentator, part of this is that Gary Coleman refused to amplify his uh, autograph. Yes. Is that the kind of thing that you think, it seems like a simple request, is that the kind of thing you can see him refusing to do? It's a little unpredictable sometimes with stars and autograph seekers. There are some people famous for being nice to people, like Dick Clark, he's a professional nice person. Mm -hmm. um, there are other people um, who may seem a little unbalanced when approached in public. Uh, they feel and they do rightfully, I think, in today's uh, culture, feel uh, threatened sometimes. Uh, they have to look over the person who's talking to them. Um, I, I wouldn't be too surprised if, if she did things, maybe with her body language or something, that, that made Gary a, a little frightened of this fan. And, of course, we've heard about the difference in their sizes and body weights. Let's go into the courtroom for the first witness. Mr. Long. Thank you. Your name Wong. is Emily Waters. What is your uh, current occupation? I'm a police officer for the city of Los Angeles, Department of Airports. How long have you worked as a police officer? Seven years. Do you have any special training as a, an officer? I attended um, Post Certified Academy and was trained in report writing, criminal investigations. And working, do you work for the airport, the LAX airport? Yes. Okay, what are your duties there as a LAX police officer? Well, I um, detour crime, try to deter crime, handle criminal investigations, prepare and um, take reports, basically try to maintain a safe environment for the traveling public. Okay. I want to talk to you about July 30th. Do you remember the events of the morning of July 30th of 1998? Yes. Okay. Do you remember where you were at approximately 11.30 a.m.? In the uniform store. Do you know what that store is called? I believe California Uniform. And is that in uh, Hawthorne, City of Hawthorne? Yes. Okay. There's, Your Honor, may I have this uh, mark as People's One? What is it, Mr. It is a uh, photo, blown up photo of the interior of the store. Yes. Ms. Waters, um, we have on display what's been marked as People's One for identification. Can you tell me what that, uh, what that picture is? That is the counter in the uniform store. Okay. And do you recall what it looked like on July 30th? Yes. Is that and you can get up and look if you need to. Is that an accurate depiction of how it appeared on that day? Basically, yes. Okay. That morning, approximately 11.30 or so, you were in the store? Yes. Do you recall what you were doing there at the time? I was picking up some uniforms and equipment. Okay, this is for work? Yes. About how long had you been there at 11.30? Um, I guess I had been in there probably about 20 minutes because they were having trouble locating my stuff. Okay. At some point when you were in there, did you see anyone who is present in the courtroom today? Yes. Can you identify that person? 
Um, the gentleman sitting at the end of the table there in the gray suit. Thank you, Your Honor. When you first saw the defendant, did you recognize him at the time? Yes. Did you personally know him at the time? No. Had you ever met him before? No. Just prior to the defendant entering the store, who was present in the store with you? There was two sales salespeople and um, another person. Okay. May I approach him? I'm handing you a little laser. Okay. You can try to work that. Okay. Uh, there's a button you can press. Using the chart, and you can stand if you need to. Okay. Using that chart, can you show me where you were standing in the store at the time? Let's see, right there. Okay, I'd like to indicate for the record, Mr. Lewis, yeah, I, so I will. The record is complete. I, I, I couldn't tell you were kind of all over okay. the place. Okay, right there, so standing directly in, in to the side of the register there. Directly in front of the in front of the register on the side of the counter. Yes. Okay, and you said there were two other people there. Yes. Do you know the names of those people? Um, uh, Tracy Fields and Mr. Coleman. Okay. Uh, were, was there anyone working at the time? Yes. Who was? And, and let's get into this before Mr. Coleman entered the store. Mm -hmm. So before he came in, you said you were there and Miss Fields was also there. Yes. Where was Miss Fields standing? She was standing right over in the corner there by those displays, the gumball machine, and I don't know what that other thing is, but right there. Okay. And for the record, that is the. The, I guess the far corner on the on the photo, it's the left side of the photo by the gumball machine. Um, and there were also two clerks in the store? Yes. Where were they standing? We'll start with, uh, do you know the names of the, of the clerks? The main clerk was Rosemary. I don't know what the other one's name okay. was. Okay. Um, they were standing behind the counter. Okay. Behind there. And that was two of them? Yes. Okay. Do you recall uh, what time the defendant entered the store? I don't know the exact time that he entered the store, no. Do you remember which door he came in from? He came in the main door, just on the other side of this gumball machine, there's a door. Okay. That's on the far uh, left side of the photo. Um, Can you see the doorway in the photo? I'm sorry, you cannot see the doorway in the photo. It is, but you're saying the doorway is... Yeah, it's just over by the side of that gumball machine. Okay. When the defendant in entered the store, did you see what he did as soon as he entered? upon first entering the store. He entered the store, and the sales clerk, Rosemary, she said, Hi, Gary. And when he first entered, I just saw the back of him because I had my back to him when he entered. And I looked at him, by the way, she said, Hi, Gary. And his statue, I said, kind of looked like Gary Coleman. I didn't know until he turned around that it was him. But um, he entered the store, and he told her that he wanted a bulletproof vest. Okay. Did they appear to know each other? Mr. Yes. Mr. Coleman and Mrs. Uh -huh. He had come into the, I la learned later that he had come into the store numerous times. Objection? Motion to strike here, sir. Staff Foundation? What was the question? Your Honor, it wasn't the question. It was a, she added a statement which we can strike. Read her answer back. Read her answer back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everything after I later learned is stricken. Ladies and gentlemen, you to disregard uh, anything that came after I later learned. Okay. I was just asking you from from what you could tell from your personal uh, from what you saw at that time. Did they seem to recognize each other? Or yes. They... Okay. Now, at some point, when Mr. Coleman was in the store, did you notice Miss Fields have a conversation with him? Yes. Okay. Do you, do you remember what the nature of that conversation was? She asked him for an autograph. Now, when you say she asked him for an autograph, do you remember the, her exact words? She said, can I have an autograph? Okay. And can you describe her tone when she said it that? It was cheerful. Okay. Was this a, did it sound like a demand or a, or a request? Or? No, it was like she was happy to see him, surprised, and she wanted his autograph. How long was this after the defendant entered the store, do you know? Maybe um, five to ten seconds. Five to ten seconds? Yeah, he wasn't in there that long before. He asked for the bulletproof vest, and um, Rosemary replied with something, and she asked for the autograph. Okay. So he had already he walked into the store, walked over to uh, the area you pointed out, yeah. had a brief conversation with... Rosemary, uh-huh. Did Tracy seem to be interrupting her, his conversation with Rosemary? No. Um, can you... Using the, the pointer again, uh, can you show me again where 
the parties were at that time when, when that request came in. Okay. Mr. Coleman was about right here asking about the bulletproof vest. Okay, and for the record, that is on the far right corner of the photograph, or uh, not the far right corner, but just okay. after the, the break in the... Can you orient it to an object depicted by the photograph? Yeah, it's just after the break in the counter, on the right side of the break in the counter. And Miss Fields was right here in the corner. Miss Fields is by the gumball machine. Yes. And you were standing in the same place you were? I was standing in the center right here. And the clerks were in their same position also? Yes. I was standing here indicating where you went points at the counter here. And you're, by, you're, uh, you're indicating that you were standing on the, almost in the middle of the photograph on the uh, corner of the counter? Yes. And that the clerks were still in their position just above you on the photograph behind the counter? Yes. Okay. Did Mr. Coleman have a response when Ms. Fields asked for the autograph? He had a, a, like a long sigh, like, and he walked over and signed the piece of paper that she had. Do you remember what he signed? Just his name. Okay. I mean, did you, do you know what color paper it was that he signed? I believe it was green. I'm not sure, though, but I believe it was green. Okay. And you said he had to walk over to do this? Yes. Okay. Can you, if you recall, can you describe... Uh, we don't have a photo of, of the doorway, but about how far away is the doorway, the front door of the store, from that uh, first gumball machine in the, in the far left corner of the photo? I would say it's at least five feet. Okay. Five feet or so. And about how much space is there between the counter and uh, it looks like, I guess, how much, how much space is there between the counter and the door? I don't know, maybe 10 feet or so. It's a, a wide area. It's a pretty wide area. Yes. Okay. Other than the side, did Mr. Coleman make any statements when he walked over? No. Okay. After signing this autograph, what did Mr. Coleman do? He walked back to his original place. Was there any further discussion between uh, Ms. Fields and Mr. Coleman? Yes, she asked if he was going to write something additional on the autograph. Okay, now when you say that, can you tell me, do you remember her exact words? Yeah, she said something like, um, aren't you going to put something more on there, like best wishes or good luck? Okay, and again, I'll ask you, what was her tone when she said this? Still cherry. Okay. Was it demanding? No. What did Mr. Coleman do at that point? He walked over and picked up the autograph and tore it up okay. and, and threw it in the trash. Can you describe when he tore it up? Can you <laughs> describe... I guess the manner in which he tore it up was it, at least from your from your perspective. It was kind of comical, like as if he was like saying, you know, gee, what else can I do? And so he went over, tore it up, and I thought he was going to write another, maybe take out a picture or something. And everything after I thought will be stricken. Please disregard anything after I thought, ladies. Did he make any statements at that time? After he tore it up. After he tore it up. Um, he said, what do you want it for? It's not worth anything. Okay. Anything else? No. Okay. And do you recall what did Miss Fields respond? She said, why would you say that? And did he respond? He said, all you want to do is show it off to your friends. Did she have a response for that? She said, um, she said, no, I want to give it to my son. Okay. And during this, this little conversation, can you mm -hmm. describe Miss Fields' demeanor? I guess she was, um, just like kind of shocked that he would tear it up or whatever. Okay. Her, her voice, what was the tone of her voice? It wasn't angry. It was just low, kind of sad, I guess. Okay. I guess you could say kind of sad. And Mr. Coleman's demeanor during that time? He was getting agitated, I suppose. Okay, when you say agitated, how, what do you mean by getting agitated? Just, I guess, trying to figure out why she was asking about this autograph and, you know, just leave me alone type attitude. Motion to strike all speculation. Overall, she's describing the person's demeanor as best as she can. Following that conversation, did Ms. Fields say anything else? Let's see. Um, he, no, he, he made a statement, the next statement. What was his statement? He said something to the degree that he wasn't acting anymore. He wasn't an adult actor. And um, then she said something because of his, his attitude, his demeanor on how he was going about doing this, she said something to the fact that 
And that's the reason why he's not a successful adult actor. Okay. Do you remember her exact words? It was that. Okay. When that statement was made, had were, were the people still positioned in the same spot as before? Yes. Uh, Miss Fields was still in the corner. He, she was still in the corner, and Mr. Coleman had moved behind the counter because the trash can was behind the counter. Okay. Following that statement, did Mr. Coleman uh, make any actions? Yes, he made a statement. He said, "Fuck you, lady. That's why I don't like people like you." Okay. What did he do at that point? Then he hurriedly walked almost like a, a trot, ran over to her area where she was standing and jumped up and socked her in the face. Okay. We'll slow it down real quick. From the time he started walking over there, mm -hmm. what he described like a trot, mm -hmm. was he, did he make any statements as he approached? No. Did he make any physical motions as he approached, as if he was getting ready to hit her? No, I had no idea he was going to hit her. Okay. When you say he jumped up in the air... Yes. Can you describe... What do you mean by he jumped up in the air? He jumped. He jumped in the air. He came off the ground. Down. Yes, his feet were off the ground. Okay. Was this, when he hit her, was it a slap or was it a closed fist? Closed fist. Okay. Do you recall where he, uh, where he hit her? It was in the face, in the eye area. Okay. Possibly right eye area, I believe. Could you tell how hard the punch was from where you were standing? It was hard. Okay. Could you hear anything when he, when he contacted her? No, I, I can't say I heard anything. From where you were standing, did it look as if Miss Fields blocked the punch at all? No. She didn't have time to block, no. Do you know if she was holding anything in her hands mm, at the time? She had, um, her purse was on her shoulder. I don't think she had anything in her hands, no. Okay. Um, now, was it just the one punch that he threw? He kept punching afterwards. After he came back down to the ground, he kept punching. Okay. And when he kept punching, did he have to... Did he have to keep jumping up to punch her? No, he... He, he stayed on the ground at that point. Okay, and where was he punching her? At, at he was point? trying to punch the upper upper body area, face and chest. Okay. Close fist or? Close fist. Were these also hard punches? Yes. At the time you're standing, are you the closest to him at the time or the closest yes. to them? Yes, uh-huh. What were you doing at the time? Well, I was looking around for cameras. I couldn't believe it was happening. It was kind of funny. So um, I was looking around to see if I was on candid camera or something. Okay. When you say it was kind of funny, you're saying the situation was funny or the punching was funny? Or the situation what? was funny. It was just too hard to believe that someone would come and go off like that. Okay. During this fight, did you hear either the defendant or Ms. Fields make any statements during no. the fight? And about how long, if you remember, how long did this, uh, this attack last? Maybe about 10 to 20 seconds. Okay. And at some point, did you join in? Did you break the fight up? Yes, they fell to the ground, and they were fighting parallel to each other. And I pushed him off, or pushed him to the side, tried to break them up, stepping okay. in between the two of them. Now, you made the statement they were fighting yes. parallel. Was, was she also throwing punches at him? She was more like pushing him, trying to get him off of her. Okay. Did you ever see her? Uh, no. Uh, did you ever see her attack him? No. How long did it take you to separate the two of them? Maybe five seconds once I pushed them apart and they stood up. They were both standing, just a, a few minutes, a few yeah. seconds rather. Okay, and once you separated them, can you just show the jury, did, did you separate them and stand between them? I did stood you? between them with my palms to each. My palm was touching him. He was still trying to get at her. She had backed off trying to get, I guess, get her composure. Okay. And you said he was still coming after her? Yes. How did he you know so that? angry because he kept hitting my palm, pushing towards her. I thought he was going to hit me. Okay. But... And was Miss Fields also hitting towards your palm? No. Did she seem to be coming after him in any manner? No. Did you notice what Miss Fields did after, uh, after you separated the two of them? Um, his pur her purse was transferred onto his shoulder some type of a way, so she noticed that and she reached past me to grab her purse and she grabbed it off of him and then he wanted to hit at her again, but he didn't. Now you say he, he just started. He just started to and I told him to calm down, relax. When you say he started to, did he actually cock back or did he... Just the pushing against my, my palm. Okay. Did she ever, when you say she was trying to grab his purse, is it possible 
from from where you were standing that maybe she was trying to attack him? No, because she said, give me my purse, and she grabbed for it. Well, a very good eyewitness for the prosecution. She's a trained police officer. She practically has a script of the dialogue between Coleman and the alleged victim. Adam, at the beginning, it sounded it sounded sad for Gary Coleman. He said, what do you want my autograph for? It's not worth anything. But quickly, to me, it seemed as if he became very agitated yeah. and upset. What do, you, what do you make of that? As far as what you know of him as a person, it should be an honor to give an autograph. It should be in a way, but I, I guess um, it revealed a little bit about Gary Coleman and, and the feelings that he harbors about his lack of success as an adult. I think her remark really hit him where he lived, mm -hmm. and this is how he lashed out. He's a small man, uh, physically, and, and, and maybe this is the only way he knows to, 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 to counteract this kind of comment. Um, she, really, she really got a rise out of him, and uh, it's unfortunate because it, if this testimony is true, then he probably went too far. It, he's a very recognizable child actor because yeah. he looks so much like he did yeah. in because of his, his problems with his kidney condition. He looks so much like he did yes, when he, yes. in, the, in, the, in the show. The, the children, the child actors on this show have had all kinds of problems. Todd Bridges was tried for attempted murder and acquitted. Um, also Dana Plato. And they've often said, is there a curse? on the Different Strokes kids. I think it's largely coincidental that the Different Strokes kids uh, made more headlines than uh, the Brady Bunch and some other people. Mm -hmm. um, or, or perhaps something was going on with Different Strokes and the people who made it in terms of uh, any sense of caring about the uh, child actors who were on the show. It could be that in the, in the atmosphere in which uh, Different Strokes was made and aired on NBC primarily that, that, that they became such huge stars that they became runaway brats and I think that's what happened to them. And, and None of the three seem to have the talent to carry it over into adulthood. Mm -hmm. Well, Dana, uh, Plato, about that so-called curse, has said, I would have crashed and burned no matter what. Stay with us. We'll be back for more of the testimony in the misdemeanor assault trial against former Different Stroke star Gary Coleman. Welcome back to Court TV. I'm June Grosso. Gary Coleman is no stranger to media attention. At the age of five, he was discovered while modeling in a fashion show. At 10, he began his role as Arnold Jackson on the hit TV show Different Strokes, which he played until the age of 17. But adulthood brought a different kind of attention as he went from television star to now courtroom participant. In his 20s, he sued his parents for mismanaging his money, and now at the age of 30, Coleman is facing criminal charges for allegedly punching an autograph seeker. But Coleman insists his punch was in self-defense and hopes to clear his name. On the stand, the first witness for the prosecution, Emily Warner. She's a police officer with the Los Angeles Police Department in the airport division. She was an eyewitness and she described the incident as after an altercation over the request for an autograph, Coleman jumping in the air and hitting the alleged victim in the eye and continuing to punch her until they were broken apart by the witness on the stand. Let's go back into the courtroom. The prosecutor is still questioning her. She called me at my job. Okay. And do you recall what the gist of that conversation was? She was saying that she was nervous and she hated that the whole thing happened. And she was just stressing out about it. Did you Ladies and gentlemen, disregard what Dennis Fields said. Did you discuss at the time what your testimony might be in this case? No. During this attack, did Ms. Fields do anything that you could tell to provoke this attack? No. Did Ms. Fields at any time block the exit door from Mr. Coleman? No. Was there, from your view, was there a sufficient room for Mr. Field, Mr. Coleman to exit the store if he needed to? Yes. Any doubt in your mind today who the aggressor in this attack was? No doubt. Did that ever change throughout the entire attack? No. I have nothing further on Okay. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, uh, we shall take our recess. And if you would, please, uh, could you all return at 145? Is that okay? Is that all right? Okay. We'll see everyone back. 145. Thank you. You may stand up. 
Commissioner Ulysses Burns, as I say, Commissioner, he is a, not a judge, and he is entitled to try these misdemeanor cases, and so that is his title. Well, we just listened to the very first witness, Emily Waters, and I have to say, Adam, that she was a fabulous witness for the prosecution. She left no doubt that who was the aggressor. Exactly. If her story uh, is true, I guess... Uh Gary's attorneys have their work cut out for them. And we know that uh, Gary Coleman was offered what seems like a very good plea bargain. He was offered a plea of no low contendere, which would mean he had a record. But that record, he wouldn't have to serve jail time, and that record would not count in the civil suit against him. Now, you know, the thing about defendants coming into court is uh, defense attorneys will tell you that though... The defendant is supposed to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the opposite way around. Most jurors figure if you're in the courtroom, you're, you're guilty. A lot of times, defense attorneys say, for stars... That's different. And they are presumed innocent because they come with a certain aura into the courtroom. And we've seen a lot of stars on court TV, and I would say the majority of them end up winning their, winning their cases. Do you think that holds true for Gary Coleman? Does he have that star status? It may not quite hold true for Gary. Um, he's not the charming, precocious child that he used to be. And unfortunately, the, the stories that people read about him over the years, you know, suing his parents, being actually currently estranged from his parents who who begged for his forgiveness on a national TV show last September um, this altercation in the uniform store um, unfortunately I think more people see Gary today as more of a sideshow attraction than, than the cute precocious kid who charmed them on different strokes so it may not be a given that that his childhood charm will, will translate into an acquittal here in this trial I, I was wondering if he he takes the stand in his defense, which we don't know if he intends to or not. Um, you've heard him on talk shows and, and different appearances. Is he engaging still? Yes, he is. Uh, his comments tend to run the gamut, though. He, he has an engaging demeanor, but he's a little bit unpredictable. Now, if his lawyer has worked well with him, then the testimony uh, could be planned well enough to, to project a, a, an image of a, of a put-upon celebrity who, who doesn't quite trust the people who come up to him for autographs and and, and doesn't feel it's his right to give autographs to everybody, and he may portray uh, the incident somewhat differently than the witness we just saw. It seems almost as if most people would be thrilled to be asked for an autograph, but that when he's asked for an autograph, that it reminds him, from some of the remarks he, he made, uh, it reminds him that he was once successful as an actor and no longer is. H did he make a try at at being a successful adult actor or did he just walk away from the business? My feeling is that when you say try, I mean, I don't know if he actually went and tried to study acting, went and aggressively tried to get roles that would be different than the role he played on Different Strokes. I think that Gary assumed that the world would be handed to him, that uh, based on his stardom as a child star, he would continue to be in demand simply because he was famous and somewhat well-liked. Um, he does show up periodically, but many times it's just to spoof himself. He shows mm -hmm. up playing himself or someone like himself. He was just on The Tonight Show last Friday night in a sketch about uh, that Jay Leno did with him about the NBA lockout. And Gary, unfortunately, portrayed an NBA player coming back from the lockout who the joke was was very short and that he wouldn't be uh, providing the best entertainment as an NBA player. So that's the kind of stuff he gets these days. And he's shopping for a bullet? proof vest? That seems a bit odd. Well, it could be that he's more paranoid about fans than, uh, than we know, or, or more paranoid than some other stars. Certainly there are, there are problems with fans. You know, people, mm -hmm. I don't know about Tracy Fields, but people aren't always innocent when they make their approaches to, to stars. They can be very aggressive. Uh, Gary is a small, uh, slight man. He doesn't weigh very much. Maybe he feels particularly threatened, or maybe he's just a bulletproof vest and uniform and gun nut. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't really know. Well, we have only heard from the first First witness, only the prosecution's questions. We have yet to hear the defense uh, question this witness and also the, defense, the defense's own witnesses who are likely going to tell quite a different story of the encounter. But certainly we have to say this first witness for uh, the prosecution was very well spoken and seemed to have a very detailed memory of the event. We'll take a break and we'll be back with more.
The court is in a rather long lunch recess in the Gary Coleman trial after hearing opening statements from both sides and just the prosecution questioning the direct examination of the first witness who was an eyewitness to the altercation. But let's take a look at the background of this trial from Court TV's Beth Karras. And all reality, and I'm certainly not being harsh, what goes on in our private lives is nobody's business. But when actor Gary Coleman found himself in trouble with the law last July, the public disagreed. Now the world don't move. He fell into fame in 1978 as the lovable Arnold Jackson on the long-running television series Different Strokes. Now, almost 13 years after the show's cancellation, 30-year-old Gary Coleman finds himself accused of assaulting one of his fans. It was here at a Hawthorne, California uniform shop that Los Angeles bus driver Tracy Fields approached Coleman for his autograph. She had asked him for the autograph. He went over there to sign it, and then she said that she wanted more than that. Coleman allegedly got upset when Fields asked him to personalize the signature for her son. He ripped it up and started yelling derogatory names towards me, and... Um, threw it in the trash and I told him he had a bad attitude about it. He said something about an attitude and then she says, well, that's why you're a child actor and you never were an adult actor. And he got upset and he went over there and he punched her. He pulled back with all his might. He's a, a grown man and he has strength and he, he gave me one really hard to my face. But Coleman insists it's Fields who started the altercation and that she's simply out to take advantage of his fame. Fields is suing the former child star for over $1 million. Mr. Coleman, you'll get the message. You're not going to get away with it, and you're not going to do Ms. Fields like this again, and we hope that you never do this to anyone else. But first, Coleman will have to defend himself in a criminal courtroom on charges of battery, punishable by up to six months in jail and a $2,000 fine. Please welcome Todd Bridges, Dana Plato, and Gary. Gary Criminal Court is nothing new to Different Strokes alumni. Since the show's cancellation, both Todd Bridges, who played Willis, and Dana Plato, who played Kimberly, have had highly publicized run-ins with the law. Now they'll be waiting to see if their television little brother can clear his name. And that trial will be going on for about two days, we think. And uh, we are going to be showing you that trial live. And I'm here with Adam Buckman, who is currently a TV columnist with the New York Post and something of an expert on the child stars and their run-ins with the law. You know, in this case, we saw in the opening statement the defense attorney, the biggest evidence he had was a huge blow-up of the civil suit that the alleged victim is is uh, is instituting which happened the day after the incident rather rather quick for a million dollars what is Gary Coleman's as far as you know situation as far as money he made a lot of it he, he did it make happen? he did make a lot of money um, he, he was very well paid apparently uh, maybe up to a salary of uh, maybe three million dollars a year by the time different strokes had ended and different strokes went into syndication and he probably enjoyed residual payments for mm -hmm. a couple of years I don't think it's on TV currently um, certainly I, I, I think he probably spent a great deal of it he bought several homes that I know about um, and and Working as a security guard was kind of a, a, a puzzle. We're not sure why uh, he was doing that. He says he did it because it's kind of a hobby for him. He kind of enjoys uniforms and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, he also claims to be a spokesman for a new chain of uh, video arcade combination restaurants on the West Coast. So he, he does do work, and he makes personal appearances and gets paid for them. Um, is he a millionaire? Well, he may be, but he doesn't. he's not pulling down the kind of money he once did. And uh, his future uh, ability to make money is certainly uncertain, so it's too bad that she's suing him for all this money. And, you know, disre disregarding the facts in the case, mm -hmm. uh, just seeing that complaint and knowing with the, how fast she filed it the day afterwards, that's got to put a little bit of a, of a bias in her testimony. And jurors have to have to wonder why she sued so quickly. And um, I think, but the facts so far, as we've seen them, of course, we've only seen one side. Um, with, with Gary Coleman, another problem is we know that he's short in stature. Mm -hmm. um, 
He's 86 pounds. He has health problems. He has a, a history of, of kidney failure, and I believe he's had two kidney transplants in his life. Currently, I believe he, he doesn't have a kidney or that the second transplant at some point was rejected or failed. So he's, he reports for dialysis treatments several times a week. I have no idea what this must be like for a person, but it must be terrible, and it must certainly affect his mood. It must affect his mental outlook. I'm mm -hmm. not a psychologist, so I really can't tell. But certainly, it's, it's, it's a part of his lifestyle that's unfortunate and, and probably has an effect on him and may even have an effect on his ability to do work in, in movies or TV because I don't know if he can put in the long days. It sounds like, except for that period of incredible fame, that he's had a lot of heartache and, and problems in his life. The, not talking to his parents, health problems. I think that that his runaway success as a child was it was devastating when it went away. Um, I think this is the syndrome of most of the child stars who get in trouble. For him, it was especially so. He was a huge, huge star. It cannot be underestimated how famous he was and how big he was. And everybody told him so. He knew he was special from a very, very early age. And when, uh, when everybody abandoned him, it must have been quite traumatic. Finally, uh, Paul Peterson, who, as we said, has this group, uh, kind of a therapy group for young uh, former actors, says the problem is that when you're a child actor, a famous child actor, there's nothing that you can do that satisfies people later on if you don't remain a star. D do you think that's true? I think it's true for, the, for, for many of the members of his group. These are people who feel that way. I think many child stars don't grow up to have the problems that Gary Coleman has. Mm -hmm. Many of them give up acting. They go to college at a certain age and they become biologists. I mean, many of them uh, don't have the problems adjusting, but for those that do, uh, I guess Paul has this service available. Yeah, and a few, uh, a few of them become famous, like Jodie Foster go or, on to be... Or infamous. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Adam Buckman, it's been really a pleasure having you, you here and having the behind the scenes uh, knowledge that you, that you have. You're going to stay on for a little bit longer with, uh, with Nancy. We definitely want you to. Nancy Grace is coming up next and we're going to have more of this trial. You missed the very beginning of the prosecution's opening statement. We're going to show you that. I'm June Grasso. Thanks so much for watching. Coming up next, Nancy Grace, stay with us. Welcome back to Court TV. I'm Ricky Kleeman. Oh, we have everything for you today. We have left Knoxville in the midst of psychiatric testimony in the Husky case. We are going to try to get that testimony to you at a later time. We are now involved in a case in Los Angeles. It's a misdemeanor case, but it has grave consequences. The defendant is Gary Coleman. He, of course, was a childhood star in TV's Different Strokes. And he's facing not only a possible year in jail for allegedly hitting, and I do mean hitting, a woman who wanted an autograph for his son, but he's also facing a million dollar lawsuit over there. Well, while all of that is happening, we also have Washington, D.C. And the latest updates, of course, on what is happening with the Senate and the trial, ultimately, of William Jefferson Clinton. So with all of that, I'm going down to the Court TV News Center and our own Dan Broden. Dan. You know, it's, it's like back here tomorrow at noon for impeachment proceedings. We still have Knoxville going on. We have the California trial going on that we're in right now of Gary Coleman. Now, I can tell you that you have not missed anything right now because... The lawyers are at the sidebar. I can see, sometimes you'll see me looking that way, I can see in my monitor if they leave the sidebar and are, are going to come back and ask questions. But while they're still there, let me talk to Murray Richmond. Murray, this is a case, you've got a jury trial. It's a misdemeanor case, little crime. That is, it's called um, battery in California. Possible year in jail and a thousand dollar fine. But that's not what this case is really about, is it? No, uh, absolutely. If this was a case not involving a celebrity, if this was a case that uh, did, did not have the panache to call national attention to it, it wouldn't have happened in the first place. This woman, who I feel sympathy if she was indeed injured, uh, obviously is looking for a big payday. And one week after this particular incident, she sued for a million dollars. Whether he has it or not, that's not the issue. But here's a man who obviously at one time of great significance on television, and here he is now reduced to being a, uh, a security guard. 
And, and it, it is kind of sad. And I'm Very. I, I'm going to break away from you for just a minute because I have seen that the lawyers are back to the question. person on the stand is Emily Waters. She is a police officer, but she's not there as a police officer. She was an eyewitness to whatever happened with Gary Coleman. Let's listen. Close to 100, uh, based on your testimony. Uh, have you ever had a situation where a victim in a case who has no familiarity or no relationship with a witness contacts uh, a witness a few days after uh, an alleged uh, incident? Not that I know of, no. Okay. And wouldn't you agree with me uh, that that is... Uh, if that happened, that would be very odd. No. Uh, you had uh, described on uh, direct examination that you had con that uh, Tracy uh, Fields had contacted you uh, a few days after this incident had taken place. Is that correct? Yes. Now, uh, you were not uh, an investigating officer in this particular case? No. You were not an arresting officer? No. You were not a reporting officer in this particular case? No. You were, uh, by uh, any characterization, uh, simply a, uh, a, a witness? Yes. <clears throat> and uh, where was it uh, that, uh, that you were contacted by uh, Ms. Fields? She called me at my job. She left a message, actually. And uh, when she had uh, left a message for you, uh, did she leave anything other than her name? No, she just left her name. Okay. Did she leave a uh, return number, uh, anything of that, so that you could uh, return the call? Yes. Okay. And uh, the uh, number that she left, you know if that was a, a home number, uh, a business number? It probably was her home number. Because it was, I worked graveyard, so I called her at night. Okay. Uh, when you had got the message, uh, did you know uh, who it was from? Yes. Okay. It had some meaning or some significance to you. Yes. Okay. And uh, you then, uh, at some point, returned the call uh, and uh, spoke with her. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, is it your testimony that that was the only conversation uh, that you've had uh, with Miss Fields? Uh, since uh, the uh, incident had occurred? No, I talked to her one other time besides that. Okay. And uh, with respect to this first time that you had uh, communicated with her, uh, how long after the incident was it uh, that you got a message from her? Regarding the first one? Yes. Um, approximately two days, I think, because I, I, I was off from work. I think she may have called me before that time, and I didn't get the message until I returned to work. And when you had uh, gotten the message, was it a singular message or were there numerous messages? I believe there was just one. And how long was it uh, after you received uh, notice of the message did you uh, return the phone call? I went to roll call and then I went and returned the call. Uh, not as far as uh, hours. I'm talking about as far as days or whatever it was after. The same day that I received the message. <clears throat> and uh, you spoke with her on a, on a second occasion? Yes. And uh, how long was that uh, after this uh, first conversation? I believe it was probably the next day because I really didn't have time to talk to her when I called her because I was getting ready to go out into the field. Okay, so did you uh, call her a second time or did she call you that following day? Mm, I believe I called her. I, I can't remember. I just know we talked on the telephone. Okay. Well, when you concluded the first conversation, did you, uh, did you conclude it by telling her that uh, you would get back in contact with her? I believe so, yes. And other than that second conversation, uh, had you ever uh, been in contact with uh, Tracy again? No. Uh, is it your testimony uh, that uh, during either of those two conversations, uh, which occurred uh, a few days after this uh, incident, that you did not speak with Tracy uh, about uh, what had transpired uh, at the location? Not what had transpired, but how she was feeling. Okay. So in essence, uh, is it your testimony that uh, Tracy had called you uh, with respect to her feelings, in other words, to, uh, to confide in you? I suppose so, yes. Uh, do you think, uh, would you agree with me, uh, that it would be extremely odd uh, for a victim, this is based on your professional experiences, that it would be extremely odd for a victim in a case who has no relationship with a witness
to contact uh, a witness uh, to confide uh, in that person with respect to their feelings uh, over something that had transpired. Your Honor, I'm going to object again based on the admonition that was given. It's also been asked and answered. Yes, ask and answer also stated. <laughs> Did you uh, suggest at a uh, certain point during the conversation uh, that uh, she seek uh, legal counsel uh, for the purpose of uh, initiating a uh, civil lawsuit? No. Did uh, Tracy speak about uh, that uh, topic with you? No. Can you think of any reason why a stranger to you uh, would contact you uh, to confide their feelings in you? Yes. I believe there's a bond between a witness and a victim. That That's the only person you can talk to that situation about that knows what's going on. Okay. Uh, you wouldn't expect that uh, a person could contact a uh, an officer involved in the case? She probably could have. Or a, a detective who may be handling a matter. I'm going to get this point and get it beyond where we were. Yeah, beyond oh. the ammunition. Oh. Oh. Ms. Waters, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any personal knowledge uh, how Ms. Fields uh, got your telephone number? I gave it to her at the scene. <clears throat> I have no further questions. Thank you, Ms. Waters. Mm -hmm. Ms. Waters, you, uh, Mr. London went through every kind of second by second what happened that day. Mm -hmm. As you, yes. you, you have to answer. Oh, yes. yes. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. As you sit here today, do you have a clear, perfect memory of what happened back in July? Yes. You do? Yes. So second by second by second, you can tell us exactly what happened? Not like that, no. Okay, that's what I'm asking. As you sit here today, do you have a perfect memory, second by second, of what happened no. in that store? Did you make any pur purchases that day? Yes. Do you remember what you purchased? Um, Check okay. Check your beyond the scope of cross-examination. Police sustain. All right, press sidebar. <coughs> When we uh, go to the sidebar in this particular case, uh, we are coming out of the courtroom, and that is because the commissioner, that is the person you see in the robes that we usually think of as a judge, Commissioner Ulysses Burns has requested that we do that, and so we are. So I'm here with Murray Richmond, and, and I got to say, Murray, it's like as I, it, my heart swells when I'm watching this young prosecutor in a misdemeanor court, you know, when these are starting out, and this is like the most important case in the world to him, right, as a prosecutor? Well, when you're young, everything you're doing is the most <laughs> important thing you do. No one else has done it before. It's the first time in life anything is ever being done, at least from your point of view. Right. And it's important. And, and, and you can see it. You can see it. Now, the lawyer who's representing uh, Gary Coleman, the defense lawyer, it's a different kind of cross-examination here. Like, it sounds like he's finding out facts that he really doesn't know about. Now, that might be true, right? Because... Rick, yeah, but, you know, we forget, as defense lawyers, what, what's the, the basic rule? Never ask a question you don't know the answer for. He's searching for answers. You're not supposed to get those. You're supposed to have your material ready. Go for your points. Don't go for a narrative. Don't go for a history. Go for your points. Develop your theory and bring it out and display it to the jury just what you have. Well, your I, opening should be a closing. Well, I agree with you 100%, and of course that's why you're so successful. But let me take a different argument on what they're doing in this courtroom. The guilty or not guilty on this uh, misdemeanor may have a lot of effect on the, the civil case that's going to come up. It, right? it, it will definitely, you no longer have to try the issues in the civil case. 
it's a it's a foregone conclusion. If there's a conviction, it's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, the quantum of proof in a civil case is mere preponderance of the evidence. Since you proved it guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, you've surpassed that standard, so the man is civilly responsible. The only issue is the amount of the damages. Well, and, if the, amount, any. and the amount of the damages could actually be huge. I just want to tell our viewers they have moved away from the sidebar just now, so we're going to go right back in. I was the making <laughs> purchases that day? Yes, I did. Okay. Do you remember how many seconds you spent picking out that purchase? I had picked it out a couple of days before. I was just coming to pick it out. Okay, I'm asking you at that time, do you remember how many seconds you spent either getting the purchase or waiting for the purchase to be brought up front? Actually, the entire time I was in the store, um, because they were having trouble locating the items. That's the reason why I was in there for such a long time. Okay, let me ask you one a different way. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the exact number of seconds? that you were waiting for that item? It probably would have been about 20, 20 minutes or so. It wasn't seconds, 20 minutes. Do you remember if that is an exact amount of time? What I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get to is, do you, as you sit here today, mm -hmm. looking back, do you remember an exact number of seconds or an exact number of minutes that it took for that item to be brought no. in front? No. seconds, Mr. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> But you do remember that you made a purchase? Yes. Okay. And this fight, mm -hmm. we broke down minute by minute, second by second, what happened. Correct? Yes. And are you positive as you sit here today that the amount of time that you gave Mr. London, these 20 seconds here, 30 seconds here, are you positive that that is completely accurate? No. Any doubt that Mr. Coleman walked over and punched Ms. Fields in the face? No doubt. Any doubt that, Ms. Field, or that Mr. Coleman continued to punch Ms. Fields? No doubt. On direct, you testified that there was no point during that fight at which time Ms. Fields became the aggressor. Is there any doubt now looking back that that may have been a mistake? No doubt. Mr. London brought up your discussions with Ms. Fields yes. following this. And you stated that you actually gave Ms. Fields your phone number. Yes. Why would you have done that? I didn't plan on staying there till the police came, and I was giving her my information so if they wanted to contact me. Okay. And despite your job as a, an LAX police officer, mm -hmm. just as a citizen, as a person, mm -hmm. did it strike you as odd that she called you? No. When you spoke with her, did you speak about the testimony that you might give in a case? No. Did you speak about the fact that maybe she should sue Mr. Coleman? No. Did you ask her for any money or anything for your testimony or for no. your help? When you said you've only had a couple conversations with Ms. Fields, have you spoken with her today? Yes. Okay. Did you speak to her about the testimony she might give? No. Did you speak to her about the testimony that you might give? No. Anything that involved this case? No. Nothing further. <laughs> I'm not asking for uh, what was communicated, but if you can describe the context in which you spoke with Ms. Fields uh, today. We talked about a little bit of everything. How was it that you came in contact with Ms. Fields today? We were in the same room. <clears throat> and when was that? Just prior to coming into here. This morning? Yes. And for how long were you together with her? It was at various times. Um, few minutes here and then she would leave out or I would leave out so it was different different times uh, during your observations of the uh, altercation that uh, you had described for us on uh, direct examination uh, is it your testimony that uh, Tracy uh, Fields uh, never uh, swung at or struck my client it was more of a pushing action my question was is it your testimony that she never punched uh, Gary yes Yes, that's correct? Yes. No questions. You may step down. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Witness. Uh, may this witness be excused? You may. Subject to uh, refinement. Ma'am, you're not excused at this time. Uh, please remain outside. Thank you. Uh, people call Miss uh, Tracy Fields. Madam Bailiff, Miss Fields, please. Tracy Fields is the alleged victim in this case, and her story is really a simple one. She says that she 
went um, uh, up to Gary Coleman. She asked him for an autograph. She wanted more. She wanted to be personalized more. And she says he got mad. And after some words were exchanged, he punched her. Well, now, Murray Richmond, I'm going to continue this conversation with you whenever I can in the next hour. You met Gary Coleman, which is amazing, like within a couple of weeks of this, right? It was, it was an interesting in instance. Uh, D.L. Ugly has his own show on uh, ABC. I hope that's not a conflict. It's another. It's, it's quite right. It's the truth. And we allow the truth. He's a friend of mine and asked me to come out and see the show in its formation. And the first two episodes were being uh, taped. And Gary Coleman was the uh, guest, secret guest star for the second episode, rehearsing about the 1970s. They had a kid party, and he was there. And they made a big fuss. And then during the breaks, I had a lot of chance to speak with him. Oh, well, this is such a good tease, because now we know you spoke to him, but I can't hear yet what you said and what he said, because the alleged victim in this case, as you can see, is taking the stand, and we're going to listen to her. State your name and spell your name for the record, please. Tracy Fields. T-R-A-C-Y-F-I-E-L-D-S. Ma'am, if you draw the mic near to you and speak right into it, please. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, Ms. Fields. Good afternoon. What is your current occupation? Bus operator. Is that the same as a bus driver? Yes. Uh, how long, sorry, how long have you been a uh, bus driver, bus operator? Since uh, November 1993. And with whom are you employed? The Metropolitan Transportation Authority. That's MTA. Okay. Do you live in the area? In, in Hart area? Hartthorne. Hartthorne. Who do you live with? My husband and two kids. Two boys. Do you recall the events of July 30th of this past year, of 1998? Yes, I do. Do you remember what you were doing that morning, about 11.30? Uh, Not really. I, I know I had plans. Um, took my son to school. No, I t took my youngest son to um, uh, day camp at um at the That's okay. I, didn't know exactly what I don't remember that well, much i knew he went to day camp that day i'll make it easier for you do you remember at some point going into a uniform store on hawthorne boulevard yes do you remember about what time approximately what time you went you entered um no i don't were you was it in the morning before noon afternoon i I guess it was um, late morning around. Were you alone at that time or were you with someone? I was alone. How did you get there? I drove myself in my car. And just in general, how were you feeling that morning? Great. Any, any medical conditions that were uh, causing you any alarm? No. Did you have any injuries to your body at all? No. Okay, specifically with reference to your face, did you have any bruising on your face at all? No, sir. How tall are you? About five, six, five, seven. Okay, and I imagine you haven't had a growth spurt since July. You were the same height back then? Yes, sir. Okay. I hate to ask the question, what do you weigh? <laughs> but, but, uh, 205. Okay. And... And I'll, I'll ask you the same thing. Have you had a large spurt since July, or are you about the same as you were in July? About the same. Okay. When you entered the uh, uniform shop, what was the purpose of going to the uniform shop? To purchase some MTA um, driving shorts. We were authorized to wear shorts, and it was hot, so I said I was going to go and get me a pair. Okay. And do you remember what the inside of the shop looked like? Yes. Okay. Directing you to what's been marked as People's Exhibit Number One. Looking at that photo, and you can get up if you need to. Is that an accurate depiction of how the interior of the shop looked on that day? Yes. Okay. You should have. I believe you have a pointer, a little laser pointer over there. Can you figure out how to operate that. Yes. You just don't want to point it at anyone's eyes. I see it. That's about it. Okay. Looking at the uh, 
at the uh, chart or at the People's One. If you need to, you can refer to it. When you got in there, were there any other people in the shop at that time? Yes. And who was in there? Do you know? Do you know their names? Yes. And what were their names? Um, Miss Emily Waters. Okay. Anyone else in the shop? I and Rosemary and her assistant. Okay. And Rosemary and her assistant, were they working there? Yes. Okay. Did you know any of them when you entered? No. Had you ever met any of them prior to that? Yes. You had? Yes. Which? Rosemary did? and her assistant. Do you know what her assistant's name is? I forgot it. Okay. Did they have the shorts you were looking for? No. Did they refer you to some place that did have the shorts? Yes. And where was that? Their other store on Olympic in Vermont, I believe, okay. between Vermont and Normandy. Did you make any phone calls that morning uh, from the shop? Yes. And who did you call? Well, I didn't make the phone call. Um, Rosemary, she made a phone call to the shop to okay. see if they had the shorts. At some point, were you on the phone? Yes. Why were you on the phone? I was dialing 911. Okay. Going back before that, were you ever speaking with the shop, this, uh, this other shop, about shorts? Uh, no, I didn't speak directly to them. As you stood at the counter, and if you can show the jury where you were standing using the pointer, where you were standing at the time we're talking about. Uh, around here. Okay, for the record, that's right by the gumball machine on the uh, People's One. As you stood there, did you come to contact with anyone who's present in court today? Yes. And can you identify that person? Yes. Go ahead. And... Mr. Coleman. Okay. Is that the, the man? Accused, Mr. Coleman. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> How long was this after you entered the store? Um, maybe five, five minutes. About five, around five minutes. And when you saw him, were there, how did you first become aware that he was in the store? Rosemary had spoke with him, spoke to him. Do you recall what she said? Hi, Gary. And did he respond? Yes. Do you remember what he said? Um, I guess he spoke back. I'm not for sure exactly what he said. Okay. What happened at that point? She was on the phone um, calling the other store, and he asked if they had any bulletproof vests. When you saw him enter the store, did you recognize who he was? No, not at first, because I, my back was turned against the door. Okay. When, from the time you first actually saw him, did you know who he was? Yes. And had you ever met him before? No. Did you know... Other than who he was, did you know what his, his past was as far as being an actor? I just knew him as a, an actor. Okay. That's what I'm asking. You knew that he was he had been on a TV show? Oh, yes. Okay. And how did describe your state of mind upon seeing him? How did you feel? I was happy to see him. Okay. I mean, were you excited? Were you nonchalant? Did, did it matter to you? I was excited to see okay. him. Would you consider, would you... Call yourself at that point a fan of Mr. Coleman's? Yes. <clears throat> you said Mr. Coleman had a conversation about a bulletproof vest. Where was, if you can use the pointer, where was he standing when he had that conversation? Around right there. I okay, guess. so uh, on People's One, that is on the far right, or just past the break in the uh, on the countertop. Yes. And what was the gist of that conversation, if you remember? Um, the conversation with me? No, the conversation about the vest. Was it just a... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll withdraw the question. Following this conversation with the vest, did you have a conversation with Mr. Coleman? Yes, I... Well, not a big conversation. I was just... I asked him for an autograph. Okay. And when you say you asked him for an autograph, do you remember the words you used? I asked him, can I have, a, um, can I have your autograph? 
And is that the same manner and tone that you used? Yes. Do you recall what he said? He came over and gave me, I had it. I was standing there and it was a piece of paper on top. Okay, when you say there, you're referring to? Uh, right here. Okay, between the gumball machine and the middle of the counter. Uh-huh, and it was a piece of paper on top of the counter and um, I got it and I asked him could he sign it. And um, he signed it. Not real sure where to mark this, but just identified. I'm handing you what's been uh, identified or marked, kind of as yes. people's two. Do you can you tell me what? How many pieces of paper are there? Uh, I think there's five, but I'm not. Better count. I'll count them. Five. Handed you five. Piece of paper. Green in color. I'm sorry. Green in color. Green in color. Do you recognize that uh, piece or those pieces of paper? Yes. What do you recognize those to be? The uh, paper that he signed. Is that the condition it was in when he signed it? No. What happened after he signed that paper? I asked him, could he address it to my son? Okay. How long after he signed it, had he started to walk back, or was he still standing there? He was still standing there. Okay, and you asked him, what was your exact statement, if you recall? I said, can you address it to my son? And, and did he, well, I'll ask you again, was it, is that the tone that you used? Yes. What did Mr. Coleman, uh, did he respond to that? No. He didn't say anything? No, he just got the piece of paper and ripped it up. Was there any conversation after that? Yes. What was that conversation? He said, um, it's not worth anything. It's, um, you can't get anything from it or something like that. I'm not really for sure exactly what he said, but he said something like, it's not worth anything. And he tore it up. When he tore it up, did he give it back to you or did he take it? He threw it in the trash. When you say you threw it in the trash, where was the trash can located? You can use the pointer. It was around in this, he went through this part and walked over. <coughs> For the record, you're saying that he went through the break in the counter and into the, like the cash register area? Mm-hmm. You said right? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. When he did that, did he remain back there? for any period? No. He uh, walked back out of the little break there and... Um, Did he ask for permission to go into that area? No. So when he was in there or when he had walked back out, at some point did a conversation resume between the two of you? Yes. Do you recall any statements he made or you made, if, if you can tell us what the conversation entailed? I told him he had a bad atti badass attitude. Okay, badass attitude. Mm -hmm. And is that the tone that you used or did you use a, a meaner tone or? It may have been meaner. Okay, why did you say that? Because he tore the um, piece of paper up and told me that it wasn't worth nothing and you know, he went on and on and said something like he hated black people. Okay. And I told him he had a bad attitude. But okay, at some point did you make did you make any statement, other statements to him? Yes. Did you recall any statements specifically? I told him I I told him that um, that's your attitude is probably why you didn't succeed as an adult star. Okay. Using the pointer. When you made that statement, can you point out where you were, if you remember? I was still standing there. Okay, and that's uh, sort of the edge of the counter by the... Well, I was still standing like in the middle of the... Between the gumball machine and the corner of the counter? Yes. Where was Miss Waters, if you remember? She was standing 
like here. Okay, and that, for the record, that's the on the pretty much the corner of the counter. Yes. And the two clerks were they still together? Yeah, they were behind the counter. Behind the cam counter. And where was the defendant when you made that statement? He um, came from around the. I'm asking not where he came from. When you made that statement, the moment you made that statement, can you point out for the jury where he was standing? I guess he was um, still around in the break in the, of the counter here. Okay, in the break of the counter. Yeah. What did he do following your statement? What did he, what did you see the defendant do? I saw him um, come from when I made the statement about him. Um, having a bad attitude. I saw him come around really fast towards me, and that's when he hit me in my eye. Okay. As he came around towards you, did he make any statements? Yeah. It was, called me a black bee, a black bitch, and um, other derogatory. And this is all as he's approaching you? Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. When, and when he yes. approached... Sorry. I was saying yes. Okay. When he approached you, did you have any idea what he was going to do at that point? No. Okay. Were you holding on to anything? I had uh, my purse with me. This large purse, small purse? It was medium. Medium-sized purse. What did he do when he got to where you were standing? He hit me. When you say he hit you, can you describe how he hit you? Is this open fist or uh, open hand, closed fist? Closed fist. Do you remember where he hit you? My eye. Yeah, which eye? This one. Yeah, for the record, right, that's the right, right eye. Right eye. Was this straight on in the right eye? Was it on the side of the right eye? It was like on the side of the right eye. Okay. Did you have a chance to block this punch? No. Did you see it coming? No. Was it just the one hit? No. What happened after the first hit? He continued to body punch me. Okay. When you say body punch, are you, do you mean with a closed fist? Yes. Is that both hands or one hand? Or do you remember? I don't remember. I, I don't remember. What were you doing at that time? I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. And, um... Uh, I had my purse in my hand on my shoulder, so it ended up I was blocking him. And then when I came to what was really the what was really going on, that's when I um, defended myself. Okay. And when you say you defended yourself, how did you defend yourself? I pushed him off of me, and I um, I believe I. Um, I can you use a pointer if you need? I kind of hit his head up against that right here. Against the counter? Yes. When you say you hit his head up against the counter, you're, did you grab his head and beat it against the counter? Did you push him into the counter? I pushed him into the counter. Okay. Why did you push him into the counter? T to get him off of me. How, long, how many times, if, if you maybe they ask this, how many times did he punch you? Do you know? I don't remember. Do you remember exactly how long this struggle lasted, if you remember? No, not, I don't remember okay. how long it lasted. Do you remember how it was broken up? Yes. How was, how was it broken up? Um, Emily Waters came between both of us, and she yelled, stop. Okay. Do you know who she, when she yelled stop, which direction was she looking, do you know? I don't know. Using the pointer, can you point out where this fight took place? Around in, around in here. Okay, near the gumball machine and towards the middle of the counter. Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. After Miss Waters broke up the fight, where was your purse? Somehow it ended up on Mr. Coleman's arm. Did you attempt in any way to get the purse from Mr. Coleman? No, I, well, I 
told Miss Waters, I asked her, could she get my purse for, for me? And did she get the purse? I, I got it. I think, I don't, I don't remember if I got the purse off of his shoulder or she did, um, okay. but I ended up getting it back. That's fine. And, and if there's anything you don't, I don't want you to make anything up. If there's something you remember, you remember. If you don't, you don't. So uh, at some point, did you make a phone call? Yes. Do you remember which phone you used? Yes. Which, which phone on the, uh, if you can show, if, if you can see it on the People's One, you can point it out. It's a fax phone that I used. It was and a fax phone. For the record, that's on the corner of the counter nearest the gumball machine. Uh, where were you standing when you, or were you standing or sitting when you made the call? Standing. Can you, can you point out where you were standing? I'm right here. Right by the gumball machine? Mm hmm What yes. was the defendant doing at that time, if you recall? I, I, I don't recall. Okay. God, this time I'd like to play the 911 tape. You wish it marked? Uh, it's, sure, it's, uh, People's Three, I guess, it's just a chart of the conversation, so. Well, you're going to play the tape, correct? Oh, I'm sorry, the tape marked as People's Three. Okay, and so um, the exhibit's marked People's Four. The exhibit will mark as People's Four. Okay. Thank Tracy, I'm going to play a tape for you, and I want you to identify the voice you hear. Okay, the date is July 30th, 1998. Time of the telephone call, 11.56 and 57 seconds. 911, yes, I just... That second voice you heard, do you recognize that voice? Yes. Is that your voice? Yes. Okay. Called it by Gary Coleman. Who is uh, your husband? No, this is my husband. He's I don't. He's a um, child star actor from Different Strokes. I'm right now at. Uh, You're calling from 13248 Boulevard. Yes, I'm at a uniform store. I asked this guy. He I've just been assaulted. He attacked me. He hit you. Yes. How long ago did this happen? This just happened recently. Just now. Just now. Where is he at right now? He's still here.
his fist. Was he in the truck by himself? I don't know, ma'am. I don't know if he was in... I don't know. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get the officer out there as soon as possible, okay? Was he in the car by himself? Uh, he looked like he was in the truck by himself. Okay, ma'am, we'll go ahead and get someone else. I'll just wait for the officer there, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Time is 11.58 and 55 seconds. End of this Fields, do you remember making that call? Yes. And were you able to hear the tape when we played it? Yes. Were there any statements that were... One moment. Any statements that you made in that tape that now looking back at were untrue? No. Anything exaggerated? No. Anything at all inaccurate in what she said there from your memory no when you hung up where was the defendant he left i don't know do you recall if he made these statements before he left yes what were those statements they have to catch me first or something like that and he said something like they'll have to catch me i don't really know exactly how he put it but it was something in that way did you let him know at some point that you were calling the police? I don't, I don't remember if I told him or not. I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. Did he make any other statements before he left? No. At some point, did any police officers arrive on the scene? Yes. Did you get a chance to speak with the officers? Yes. How long was this after the 911 call, after you got off on the 911 call? They came right away. Um, I don't remember how fast they came, but I know they got there really quick. Did you speak with the officers at the scene? Yes. Did you tell them anything different than what you told us in court today? No. At that time, did you have any injuries as a result of the attack? Yes. Can you describe, were there any, any visible injuries at, at that time? Yes. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. Did you get a chance to look at yourself in a mirror? No. See? Bit, sorry. You can go ahead. Oh. Sorry. Referring specifically to your face, did you get a chance to look at yourself in the mirror? Not right after it, the incident had happened. Okay. At some point, were you able to look at yourself in the mirror? Yes. And did you notice any injuries at that point? Yes. When was that? Um, when I went to the hospital, okay. I, had, I had seen that it, my eye was swollen and a black rules there. And when you're referring to your eye, you're referring to your right eye? Yes. Uh, did you have any pain just as far as your face goes? Did you have any pain at all? I had a migraine headache, I know. Okay. Any pain to your eyes? Yes. Right eye, left eye? My right eye. Any pain to the rest of your, of your body? No, not really. And are we at people's five now? Three, uh, seven. Uh, no. Uh, Four. Okay. So the next in order would be five. Thank you. Marking uh, people's five for identification. Show me what's been marked as people's five for identification. Can you tell me what that is a photo of? Of my, of me. Of, of you, specifically your your face or just your eye? They were trying to get a picture of my my face with where he had hit me in my eye my right eye do you remember who took that photo no was that taken at the scene or was that taken at the hospital it was taken at the scene at the scene and was this by was it by officers by rosemary uh, by a police officer okay. did you when you were at the scene did you uh, sign any paperwork i remember signing something did you read through it before you signed it? No. Did you sign one, just one thing or a number of things? I don't remember how many things. I think it was, I'm not for sure on how many pieces of papers I, I had um, signed. At some point, were you offered any medical assistance at the scene? Yes. And 
when was this? Was it just one time or was it more than once? More than once. Okay. On the first time, who offered you assistance the first time? The ambulance, they automatically came. I'm not for sure who called the ambulance, but I think they just automatically came with the, um, from the 911 call. Okay. And did you speak with uh, the paramedics at that point? Yes. Did they offer you any assistance? Yes. Did you accept the assistance? They took my blood pressure and I believe my pulse and everything. Did then, they off then they offered me to go with them, but I was, I was so scared and, you know, shaken up. I didn't have anybody there with me that I knew, so I didn't, um, I refused the service. And at some point, were they called back? Yes. Do you know why they were called back? Uh, Rosemary, is she in... If it's in your... Did you call the paramedics back? No. The paramedics at some point returned to the scene? Yes. At that point, how are you feeling? Shaken. Um, I don't. I don't know. I just felt scared. I know. Did you go off with the paramedics, or did you uh, leave the scene on your own? I went with the paramedics. Was this by ambulance, by automobile? Ambulance. Do you know where you were taken to? Yes. Yes. Where were you taken? Um. J.F. Kennedy um, Hospital. Is it RF, RFK? RFK, yeah. I'm confused. I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, do you remember at the hospital, did you just go to the emergency room? Yes, I just went to the emergency. And did they treat you at all there? Yes. Anything significant? No. Now you said at some point at the hospital you got a chance to look at your, to see what your face looked like. Yes. Looking at the photo of people's five, is that an accurate depiction of what your face looked like once you arrived at the hospital? Yes. Okay. You want to kind of publish that to the jury? Has it been bitter death that's this much on? Well, then people would offer it, uh, people's five in evidence. Objection. Objection. So. No objection, Your Honor. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Trace, looking at people's five, um, you know, I'm going to put it here. If uh, you're able to point with the pointer from where you're sitting or you might have to stand up, can you point out where the injury that you're discussing, where it is? Along here. Okay. For the record, you're pointing to the right corner, a little bit below your eye? Yes. And is that the sort of off-color... Uh, mark that we see there or that I see there yes did you have any injuries to your eye in that area before you entered the shop no are you sure about that positive anything further happened that night this is we're on July 28th uh, I'm sorry July 30th anything happened after you left the hospital that is of any significance to this case Everything was blew out of proportion by the media and the, and I was I was afraid. I was scared because I had never been in anything like this before. Okay, at, at some point following this day, did you contact an attorney? Um, the next day. Okay. And how did you come to contact with what what is the name of the attorney? Robert McNeil. How did you come in contact with Mr. McNeil? A friend of mine who works at a law firm suggested for me to get an attorney, and she um, referred me to him. Did you call your friend, or did your friend call you, or how did that work? My friend called me. Do you know why your friend called you? Because she has... If it's in her knowledge of why her friend called. Do you have personal knowledge, man, as to why your friend called? She saw me on um, the TV, she said. 
When did you meet with Mr. McNeil? The next day, okay. after the incident. Do, do you recall where you met with him? At his office downtown L.A. Did you have any discussions with him about what had occurred? Uh, what, what had occurred on the 30th? Yes. How long did you meet with him, if you remember? Uh, maybe 20, 30 minutes. At the end of your meeting, did you come up with any conclusions or any plan? No. Was a lawsuit ever mentioned? I'm, I'm not for sure exactly if, if um, we had discussed the lawsuit or what. I'm not f really for sure about the whole conversation that we had. Well, how many times did you meet with Mr. McNeil following in the, in the days following this event after the 30th? How many days did you meet with him? One time. Okay, one time. Do you remember ever having a conversation with Mr. McNeil involving a lawsuit? Yes. Is it fair to say that, or it is, in your memory, is it possible that you spoke with him on that day, the 31st, about the lawsuit? I could have. I'm, I'm not for sure. Okay. As a result of your conversations, or your conversation, do you know if a lawsuit was filed? No. I don't know, I don't know if he had... I don't know if lawyer McNeil had filed a lawsuit that day or what. I'm not for sure. Okay, let me ask it a different way. As a result of those conversations, do you know if a complaint was filed or if anything uh, leading towards the lawsuit had been initiated? On the 31st? I'm just asking in general, on the day following this incident, you had a conversation with Mr. McNeil. As a result of that conversation, was a lawsuit eventually at some point in time filed? Yes. Okay. Whose idea, was it your idea to file this lawsuit? Um, no. Did you agree with Mr. McNeil in filing the lawsuit? Yes. Did you draft the lawsuit? No. Did you, were you present when the lawsuit was drafted? No. Did you discuss an amount of this lawsuit with Mr. McNeil? No. Did Mr. McNeil tell you what the amount of the lawsuit would be? No. Did you discuss how much your injuries had cost you and how much your medical had been at that point? No. Anything about lost wages, anything about any damages to you at that point other than the injury? No, we didn't discuss any of that. Following, th this was on now the 31st, was when you had this conversation, correct? Yes. Okay. Following that, did you at any point have a press conference? Yes. Do you remember what day you had a press conference? Um, um, I believe it was the f um, following Tuesday, or Monday or Tuesday. Do you remember what day of the week that would have been? No. Okay. The event happened on a Thursday, is that correct? I'm not for sure exactly what day it was. Okay. But at some point you had a press conference? Yes. Who was this press conference with? Mis my lawyer, Mr. McNeil. Where was the press conference held? At his office. This is downtown? Yes. Who was present at the press conference other than you and Mr. McNeil? Um, was there any, I assume there was press there? News media. Okay. Did you, uh, did you address the media? Yes. Was it your idea to hold a news conference? No. Whose idea was it to hold the news conference? My lawyers. Did you uh, Mr. McNeil. Did you receive any fee for attending the news conference? No. After this conference, in the months after July, did you ever appear on any television shows to discuss what happened on July 30th? Yes. Do you recall what shows you appeared on? Lisa. Extra and um, Mother Love, Forgive and Forget. Okay. Starting with Lisa, who arranged your appearance on the Lisa show? Uh, believe my lawyer. Believe or? He, it was him. Did you have anything to do with calling Lisa up and putting yourself on the show? No. Did you receive a fee from Lisa for coming no. on? Was that filmed here or taped in L.A. or taped in Chicago or? It was taped in uh, Hollywood.
the Mother Love show. Was that Forgive and Forget with Mother Love? Yes. Who arranged for you to appear on that show? My lawyer. And did you receive a fee for appearing on that show? No. The other one you mentioned, I believe, was Extra? Yes. Who arranged, you, who arranged for you to be on Extra? My lawyer. And did you receive a fee from Extra for appearing on that show? No. Have you, to this date, received any fees for being on any show? No. As you sit here today, do you have any, do you have any book deals involving this, this case? Mm-mm. No. Do you have any movie deals involving this case? No. Do you have an agent or a publicist? No. Anyone other than Robert McNeil? He's the only person. Has anyone told you that you would be somehow compensated for your appearance in court today? Or that, well, bad question. Anyone told you you would be compensated for your testimony in court today? No. Has anyone tried to direct what you would testify to? No. Have we had any conversations about your testimony? Yes. And have I told you what to say when you got in here? No. Have you spoken to any tabloid magazines about this case? No. Have any magazines approached you about this case? Yes. And why didn't you speak with them? I just want a simple life to be. I, I, I just want my life to be back normal. I, I, I'm sick of everything. Like, I just want my life to be back normal, and I just didn't want to. Okay. Following the July 30th incident, did you ever speak with any of the people that were present in the store? Um, no. But had I talked to them before the incident happened? No, I'm asking after the incident. Do you remember after, after the incident speaking with Emily Waters? Yes. Okay. When you spoke with Miss Waters, what was the point of, did you call her or did she call you? I called her. Why did you call her? Just to, um, I, I, just to speak with her. I'm not really for sure. I just called her and I think I talked about, I'm really not for sure exactly what I said to her. But I did speak with her. Did you try and get her to help you or aid you in any way in, this, in the civil suit? No. Did you try and get her to help you or aid you in any way in the criminal suit? No. Did you speak to her about the fact that you had just seen an attorney and there may be a lawsuit filed? No. I don't believe I mentioned that. Okay. Have you spoken to anyone else that was present in the store that day? No. Have you spoken to Mr. Coleman since that day? No. We discussed the lawsuit that you have. I'm just going to ask you, given your participation in this suit, given what's going on here, why do you have a civil suit against Mr. Colton? He humiliated me. He, my simple, I'm a common person. I work every day. And he just put me in the limelight. And I, I, and I didn't choose to be there. You know, he humiliated me. He, I can't go I, when I'm at work. People is recognizing me. You know, you let this person beat you up, and you know, just I'm just. I guess I'm asking why. I understand that. Why would you file a civil suit though against Mr. Coleman? Question has to answer. Always a state. must be a lawyer. Fine, I have nothing for Okay. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, why don't we take a stretch? You've been there for about an hour and a half almost. Well, they are going to uh, take a break, it looks like, and um, as he says, he's there, he's going to let them stretch their muscles, and it'll give me an opportunity, not for us to stretch our muscles, but i got to have you finish your story before we leave here at 6.30 Eastern. So there you are. You're on a TV show three weeks after this incident. Gary Coleman is there. What was he like? Well, I can understand he might not have been as, uh, in the same way that he was under the circumstances here, but he was charming. He was a delightful young man, young man. But you know what I found? I shook his hand. and I saw, He was wearing a short sleeve shirt because he was changing shirts. And you saw the dialysis marks because he takes dialysis virtually, I think, every day. Every day. Because he has kidney failure. That's the reason why he was, he's been, uh, well, 
That's why he's so small. That's why he's so small. But he has no upper body strength. So, so let's talk about that, Murray. You shake somebody's hand, and I mean, I can shake your hand. You, you, you feel know? the strength, the muscle right. strength. Right. And it was like what? Like nothing? It, it was like shaking a hand of a six-year-old child mm. because his, you know, even if he tried to close the hand, there, there just didn't seem to be tremendous muscle control. I'm not suggesting that he, this, he couldn't have done what, what they right, say right, right. he did, but I'm suggesting that the possibility exists that he may not have had the amount of force necessary to create the injury sustained. Now, his defense in this case is self-defense. Now, we've seen the photo of her injury. There's no question there is some injury to the eye. He's not saying it didn't I, I, happen. I'm not going to agree with you on that. Oh, I can't agree all right. With you. No, I'm not the defense with lawyer in your speech. No, but it is. Looking at that injury, um, there, it did appear that a low portion of her face was lightened to make the upper portion look darker. Or if you were a defense lawyer, that's what you'd say. There's no question. I'm just saying my observation. But there's no question there's red around the eye. I mean, there's no <laughs> doubt about that. And we, I don't think we're going to hear him deny that he hit her. I think what we're going to hear is that he did it in self-defense. So that brings me to, to the obvious. This is a tiny man. I mean, tiny. He's four, four foot eight. Yeah. Um, he doesn't weigh a lot. We look at him now. I mean, even just when the camera goes to him, he's itty bitty. She says she is five foot six. She says she weighs two hundred and five pounds. And this is a this is a big woman. So, what what do you need to do as a defense lawyer besides have the two of them stand side by side? Well, besides staying side by side, you know, David was smaller than Goliath also. True. And, of course, that would be the prosecution's position. True. But uh, you, you'd emphasize the dichotomy, the difference between a, a powerless man with no upper body strength against a woman who's a strong, full-bodied full woman with, uh, who outweighs him by 70 or 80 pounds. And if you put a boxer in a ring who is 70 and 80 pounds different, it makes no difference with the man or woman, especially if the, if the man is debilitated in some manner, shape, or form, as Gary Coleman is. Uh, you have a difference. You emphasize that point. You know, i got to tell you, I'm never going to knock a lawyer on television. But I know we've been I going crazy. Going no, to, we've we been going crazy. We can say it because you and I have defended countless cases and you and i are sitting here going object object, object. i mean could we're you, going off the seat could you tell me the relevance if you could or anybody out there could tell me the relevance of how the uh, what she said to her lawyer whether she wanted to make the suit whether she didn't and how gary colvin changed her life she was the one who called attention to it, it she was the one who put who went to the press she was the one who called attention to herself in every way and then she says he he did it to her well let me say this let's say that this is how she really feels let's say she feels that he has put her in the limelight and all the stuff she said is true the reality is you would never let that come out in this courtroom. Well, it couldn't come out. It's of no consequence. It is, this is not a civil case. Her damages are not accessible here. Right. The issue is simple. Did he do the act, and was there any provocation for doing the act? The, the effect of the act, how she felt, what her best friend said to her, what the lawyer said, how many times she was on television, is of no relevance whatsoever. Okay, and as you can see, we are not heated about this at all, right? We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, they are in recess, but we have our Beth Karras there. We're going to check in. Welcome back to Court TV. I'm Ricky Kleeman, and as you know, today we have two live trials going on at Court TV. We have gone away from the Knoxville trial, which I am sure is over by now. We'll get that testimony to you at some point. We we have gone into California, into Englewood, into a court where there is a trial for a misdemeanor battery. And the defendant is none other than Gary Coleman, who was a very, very popular TV star in the show Different Strokes back in the 70s. And now he's accused of really whacking a woman in a store last year. Well, our Beth Karras has been watching this case since the beginning. And Beth, I want to ask you first, you know, you heard Murray Richmond, my guest and I, we were like out of our seats here about the defense, not objecting to all this stuff about the civil suit coming in. What happened this morning before the jury came in about this civil suit? There were arguments on a few uh, items that uh, both sides were disputing should or should not be introduced into evidence and the judge ruled before opening statements so that the lawyers knew what they could or could not say when they gave their openings earlier today and one of the issues that was discussed was the civil suit and the extent to which the jury should know about the civil suit. The prosecution admitted that the fact that there is a civil suit is relevant certainly to the credibility of Tracy Fields but that the jury should not see the actual cr the civil complaint nor should they know 
the amount of damages that Tracy Fields is seeking. He said that's really not relevant, whether it's $100,000 or a million dollars. But the judge ruled against the prosecutor and said the complaint can come in if the defense chooses to uh, introduce it and that the jury is entitled to know everything about so, this. So suit. ultimately then the prosecutor says to himself, well, if the defense lawyer is going to introduce it, I'm going to beat him to the punch, right? That's right. And the defense attorney did give uh, a bit of detail in his opening statement sure. about it, including the amount. Well, you know, it's uh, Murray and I are saying from here, if we were sitting there, we would not let the prosecutor get all of this in, in direct examination. But nonetheless, here it is. Well, the real question is how it affects the members of the jury. Tell us about the jury composition. There are 12 jurors. That's not my uh, experience in misdemeanors, at least in New York, where we have six jurors in a misdemeanor. But there are 12 jurors, and it did not take very long yesterday afternoon to pick those 12 jurors. Two alternates were selected this morning. Now, the jurors are six men and six women and they are racially mixed, although predominantly white. There are nine whites, two blacks, and one Hispanic. The alternates are one man and one woman, both white. Now, Beth, in, we have learned, of course, from the O.J. Simpson case that race certainly became an issue, not necessarily in the case, but certainly in the commentary about the case. In this particular case, we've heard the woman who says she was struck. Tracy Fields says that there were racist remarks made at her by Gary Coleman. Now, of course, you have an African-American defendant and you have an African-American complainant. And yet we only have two African-Americans on the jury. Now, was the prosecution knocking African-Americans off or was the defense? It appears that the defense was, and it was a very mixed pool of jurors yesterday, and at one point there were far more blacks on the jury, and there weren't that many peremptory challenges exercised, that is, those, those uh, uh, challenges for which you don't have to state any basis for removing a person. Each side had ten, but they didn't exercise wow. anywhere near ten of them, which is pretty incredible, I think, for a misdemeanor. Uh, in any event, it appears that the defense was excusing more of the blacks, and each side is happy with the jury that they have. So well, who, knows? Uh, who knows? It's an right. educated and it's, a, it's an educated jury, too. There's a lawyer, there's a trial lawyer on the jury, and there's a banker, there's an accountant, there's a teacher, uh, and a number of other professionals. So it's a, a fairly sophisticated jury. Well, I'll tell you, if I were defending this case, and I'll bet when I get back to Murray in a second that he's going to agree with me, if I were defending this case, I think I might like some very educated people on this jury because this is a reasonable doubt case, and Murray is agreeing with me. Um, I want to ask you about whether or not we're going to hear from Gary Coleman, because, of course, we'd like to, right? Well, it's a big question, and it's something the defense lawyer will not tell me, and that's not unusual, because if he tells me that I'm going to report it, and then the prosecution will know about it. But um, I, I did say to him just a, an hour or so ago, how are you going to prove Gary Coleman's state of mind, that he felt cornered by this woman, that he felt that he needed to strike before being uh, struck by her? So how is that coming in if you don't put him on the stand? And he said, well, if we ever get to that, which led me to think that he'll make the routine motion that that all defense lawyers make at the end of the prosecution's evidence to dismiss the case for failure to put on a sufficient case. And, and, and that and, motion, as we know, is very rarely granted. Um, and in this case, there's, there's some problems there. You've got a woman who claims that she was injured. We have a photograph of her injury for whatever or it may or may not be worth. And we have eyewitness who says she was punched. So it seems really hard for me to understand how a judge is going to give a judgment of acquittal since you have to look at everything in the light most favorable to the government. That's right. And every witness who was there, except for Gary Coleman, is a state witness. So it's not as though there's anyone there who is going to testify for the defense and, and who will see something different from what the state's witnesses have said. The defense may recall some of these state witnesses, but the four people in the store, besides Gary Coleman, are, are the four witnesses for the prosecution. We've heard now from two of them. Um, and he may call the other two. He may only call one more. It, it, it's not uh, a certain. In any event, I think that it's possible if this motion to dismiss is denied that Gary Coleman could plead. Because there's an offer out there that's still out there. I asked the prosecutor this morning, and it's a plea to a no low contendere, which means it's a conviction, but it can't be used against him in the civil suit, which is a big concern, big, of course, of Gary Coleman. Thing. And a, right. no low, a no low plea is kind of a, I'm not really guilty, but I, I'm not going to contest the fact that I'm guilty. What's and he'll get a non jail sentence. Right, and it's a non jail sentence, so he won't go to jail. It'll be a conviction, however, but it can't be used against him in the civil suit. So if he loses this motion to dismiss, 
he may as well plead because he's got more to lose if he gets convicted. It's fascinating, I have to tell you. And Beth, I know you have to get back in there, and I want to thank you as always. And we're okay. certainly going to find out what's happening tomorrow. Thanks again. And here in New York, I got to follow all this up with Murray. Now, what do you think? No way, judgment of acquittal from the judge at the end of the, the state's case, Well, there's right? no evidence. I mean, look, you have to say it from the point of view of the prosecution, they made their prima facie case, which is all they have to do in this particular instance. And that is sufficient evidence. And that means, when, so are, you know, that means prima, like, go ahead. The word prima facie means first face, on its first blush. They have to uh, introduce evidence that a crime was committed and the defendant likely committed that crime. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a, it's a really different standard at that particular like point. Like a feather, I always yeah. say. And they've done it. Sure. I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to be disingenuous or completely blind, deaf, dumb, and without understanding. Sure. And no offense meant to anybody who is indeed uh, suffering from any disability. Thank you. Okay, I get, I know. No, it's very important. But thank you for being sensitive. You have to be aware that there's a case has been made out. Sure. Now, the only way he can contest this case, if he intends to contest it, is to take the stand himself. So Beth's view that he may take a plea on a NOLO is very significant. Well, it's significant, and it, if, if the offer, in fact, is still open, it's very wise, right? Because I did not know that in California, if you have a NOLO plea, that is, in essence, you're not saying I did it, but you're saying that, in essence, that they could prove that I did it. I think that's one yes, way to construct it. That, um, that if it's not going to be introduced in the civil suit, then he's in very good shape, right? It comes as a surprise to me. We don't have that here in New York. Oh, no, low plate, right. There's no such thing. However, apparently in California where they have, it's a wonderful land and a wonderful country where a lot of things happen that nothing else happens anywhere else, uh, they do have such a thing. And if that's the well, case... Well, and, and for our California viewers, there are no low pleas in other places besides California, too. Yeah, but not very many. But with <laughs> all due respect, I, I love California. It's the most beautiful country, you know, part of the country, but... Their view of law is somewhat... Uh, well, it's scared. just different than ours. And just as, you know, I practice law in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, we had something that was called an Alfred plea. We have Alfred plea. Which you have here, which is it, really what I said. That is, I'm, I, don't, I didn't do it. But I believe the government could prove me guilty, so I'll, uh, I'll go along with it. Now, in this situation... You've also got Gary Coleman as someone who took flight. He left the scene and he left. I mean, they had to go advertising for him to come back in. Now, does that, we would think it doesn't help him. But I bet you could give a, a, a version where it oh, could. You know that flight is, shows consciousness of guilt. It is the weakest evidence of consciousness of guilt. So you can reasonably infer that the man had something in his mind and that's why he ran away. However, you have a man with this, this, you know, this physical disability, a man of some prominence, a man of some, uh, who's not on the, doing the best of circumstances, and he's embarrassed. Sure. And you can justify his saying, I just couldn't face these people looking at me as if I'm some kind of a freak. And just to leave under those circumstances justifies the flight. But it could be and argued equally that flight is consciousness of guilt. And that's the law in the state, in every state. Every state. Because consciousness of guilt is one of those things. Well, Murray, I, I have to say this, and it's not false flattery. I would love to be able to see you try this case for the sake of watching someone with your passion and your commitment in this kind of a case. And I'm going to congratulate you. You just won your, I don't even know how many murder cases. On Sunday, a jury came uh, back, right? Just before the Super Bowl, the jury was out from Thursday to Sunday and not guilty on murder and not guilty on manslaughter. And I was, it was it's a amazing. good verdict. It's amazing. You're one of the best, and I thank you for joining me. Come back again at 4.30 to 6.30 with me. I love having you here. Thank you. All right. That's all the time we have for tonight. But, of course, we want you to join us tomorrow morning at 9 for our continued live coverage of the murder trial of Thomas Husky. Tomorrow afternoon, we're going to also have continued coverage of the assault trial of Gary Coleman and, wait, the Senate trial of President Clinton. But for right now, stay tuned for another edition of Pros and Cons. That's followed at 7 Eastern time by another episode of Homicide, Life on the Street, and by Johnny Cochran tonight at 8.30. And Ricky Kleeman, for all of us here at CORE TV, have a great evening. in our private lives is nobody's business. He played the adorable child star of the 80s sitcom Different Strokes. But these days, prosecutors say Gary Coleman is acting more like a disagreeable adult. He went over there and he punched her. He got in the rage and hit me in my eye, my right eye here. 
Now Wait, Coleman, Mark. a security guard, faces assault and battery charges. She said, excuse me, Mr. Coleman, is there any chance I can have an autograph? Mr. Coleman punched her in the eye. He instinctively reacted to protect himself. Another child star in trouble. Gary Coleman goes to court. This is a prison. They use knives for things other than cooking. He traded chocolate bars for prison bars. Now Andrew Somers teaches criminals how to make killer dishes. Child actors. When the show ends and the fans go away, these rising stars often fall pretty hard. Welcome to Pros and Cons. I'm Greg Jarrett. Hello, everybody. I'm Nancy Grace. Former child star Gary Coleman charmed his way right into American homes. But when Coleman's sitcom, Different Strokes, was canceled, the tiny actor faded from the spotlight. But now he's back. But he's in a role he doesn't want. Court TV's Michael Ayala has more. Nancy, we've all read the newspaper reports about former child stars in trouble with the law. Well, actor Gary Coleman now is no different. The ex-sitcom star is on trial after an autograph-seeking ex-fan claimed that a simple request led to a violent altercation. There are a lot of reasons in this business where people are not allowed to do whatever they want to do. Um, it does. It, may, it makes you feel crazy. It makes you want to lash out. And lashing out is exactly what former fan Tracy Fields says Gary Coleman did last July when she asked for an autograph. He pulled back with all his might. He's a, a grown man, and he has strength. And he, he gave me one really hard to my face. Now the former star of TV's Different Strokes is in a Los Angeles criminal court facing battery charges. At one point she came back and to get her purse. Give me my purse. She walked over and she tried to grab her purse. Mr. Coleman again tried to go after her. According to this eyewitness and off-duty police officer, the trouble began after Fields recognized the 30-year-old former child star in a California uniform shop. She asked him for an autograph. Now, when you say she asked him for an autograph, do you remember the, her exact words? She said, can I have an autograph? Okay. And can you describe her tone when she said it that? It was cheerful. Fields claims that when she asked Coleman to personalize the autograph to her son, the diminutive actor lost his cool. He ripped it up and started yelling derogatory names towards me and um, threw it in the trash. And I told him he had a bad attitude. She was um, just like kind of shocked that he would tear it up or whatever. Okay. Her, her voice, what was the tone of her voice? It wasn't angry, it was just low, kind of sad. Today, Coleman's attorney claimed that the four foot eight inch, 86 pound actor was the real victim of the five foot eight inch, 200 pound Tracy Fields. He was being crowded uh, by Ms. Fields and that he believed that she was going to jump on him. Coleman fled after the alleged attack and later turned himself in after a warrant was issued for his arrest. He pled not guilty to the battery charge. Even if I did say that he was a better child star than a, an, an adult star, um, that, give, that still didn't give him a right to hit me. The role of criminal defendant is very different from the persona Coleman used on the once popular TV series, different strokes. As the quick-witted, cherub-cheeked Arnold, Coleman charmed audiences for nearly eight years. But things have changed. Coleman has had trouble finding work. At the time of the incident, he was working as a security guard. Do you ever get sick of talking about different strokes? No. Oh, yeah. Coleman becomes the third of the show's three child stars to run afoul of the law. Co-star Dana Plato has robbery and forgery convictions, and Todd Bridges has served time for drug possession and has been tried and acquitted for murder. But if Fields' attorney has his way, Coleman is in for a bit of a different stroke. You're not going to get away with it. Now, late this afternoon, the alleged victim, in fact, just minutes ago, Tracy Fields took the stand. During direct examination, the jury heard a tape of her 911 call shortly after the incident. Hey, you don't need the paramedics? No, he just attacked me. Do you know why? I, I asked the guy for an autograph. And he, I said, would you put something else on there? And he went off. He tore the paper up. He went off. Did he hit you also? Yes, he hit me in my eye. 
Now, if convicted, the one-time comic actor is facing some very serious charges. Coleman could face up to six months in jail and a $2,000 fine. And by the way, just in case any of you were wondering, the alleged victim in this case has filed a reported $1 million civil suit. And Nancy, if she wins, I'm not sure what she'll collect, because word has it, Coleman is very close to broke. Michael, thanks. Greg. I don't know, but I'm just wondering about how the jury is going to react if and when they find out when this woman gets cross-examined that she's filed a $1 million lawsuit. Oh, yeah, when they find out about that, and they already know some of it, uh, that might influence their decision. Plus, I see the she deserved it defense coming up, and that might work pretty well. I'm telling you, Greg, when they hear about that $1 million lawsuit, it'll put that 911 <laughs> phone call in a whole different light. Everybody's still ahead in the new thriller, Billy Strait. A 12-year-old runaway witnesses a sensational murder. And this runaway hit has jumped straight to number four on the bestseller list. It's author Jonathan Kellerman. Child star Gary Coleman assault Tracy Fields, or was he protecting himself? Good morning. Welcome to Court TV. I'm Raymond Brown. This morning, highlights from California versus Gary Coleman. Tracy Fields says she was assaulted by Coleman after asking for a personalized autograph. Defense attorneys say Coleman felt threatened by Fields when he struck her. And they allege that Fields is just in this for the money. Yesterday, she took the stand, and we're going to bring you highlights from her testimony in a few moments. At 10 o'clock, we return to Knoxville, Tennessee, and the murder trial of Thomas Husky. Husky stands accused of murdering four women just seven miles from the Knoxville Zoo. Although the defendant has confessed to the killings, defense attorneys contend he did so in order to frame himself. They claim Husky suffers from what used to be called multiple personality disorder and was framed by one of his alter egos. Well, it sounds like to complement the full day in the Court TV News Center, we're going to have a full day here in the studio because we have the Senate impeachment trial of the president involving Washington coverage. That starts at 12 noon Eastern time. The murder trial of Thomas Husky from Knoxville, Tennessee, starting at 10 o'clock Eastern time. And as a slight change of pace, in a few moments, the assault trial of Gary Coleman. Uh, Court TV's Beth Karras, in fact, has been covering the Coleman case and files this background report. Since the show's cancellation, both Todd Bridges, who played Willis, and Dana Plato, who played Kimberly, have had highly publicized run-ins with the law. Now they'll be waiting to see if their television little brother can clear his name. Certain sadness there. Well, we're going to be covering that story in a moment. Gary uh, was scared. And he can tell you uh, that he was being crowded uh, by Ms. Fields and that he believed that she was going to jump on him. Gary Coleman is known for his performance of the role of Arnold on the popular sitcom Different Strokes, which was telecast in the late 70s and early 80s. He's no stranger to fans asking for autographs, but one such fan has now taken him to court accusing him of battery. Coleman is in a California courtroom charged with misdemeanor battery charges for allegedly attacking a woman after being asked for a personalized autograph. Welcome back to Court TV. I'm Raymond Brown. Coleman claims he felt threatened by Tracy Fields and acted to defend himself. Fields claims she was assaulted by the former child star. We're now showing you highlights of testimony from yesterday, including the testimony of the alleged victim, Ms. Fields. But Ms. Fields, you indicated uh, that you had spoken with an attorney, a gentleman by the name of Robert McNeil? Yes. And you indicated that you spoke with him sometime, uh, well, you recalled it being the uh, day after the incident which you've been testifying to? Yes. And uh, you indicated you met with him at his office? Yes. And you described uh, speaking with him for a period of about 20 minutes? 20, 30 minutes. Okay. And uh, was that the entire... Uh, was that the only instance in which you spoke to uh, that person uh, about uh, what had happened? Was he the first person that I spoke to? Was that the only time you spoke to that person about uh, the incident? No. I had talked to him the day after and other times after the July 31st. Okay. <clears throat> When you spoke to him on, uh, July 31st, on July 31st, you indicated uh, you didn't speak to him about uh, a lawsuit. Is that your testimony? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> did uh, uh, You're aware uh, that a, uh, a lawsuit uh, was filed uh, as it relates to uh, this particular case? I was aware of it the day of the press conference. 
uh, and you're aware that, uh, that the lawsuit uh, is filed on your behalf. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, is it filed on anybody else's behalf other than your own? No. <clears throat> What time was it uh, that you met uh, with uh, Mr. McNeil? I don't recall. It was in the morning. I don't recall exactly what time it was, but it was in it was in the morning time. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, when you uh, uh, went to that location uh, for a period of about 20 minutes or 30 minutes, uh, were you there alone with uh, Mr. McNeil? No, I was with my husband. Okay. <clears throat> and other than yourself uh, and your husband, anybody else? That's it. Okay. And what is your husband's name? Charles Randolph. The uh, friend that you had described on uh, direct examination uh, who had introduced you to, uh, to Bob McNeil, what is that person's name? Kimberly Rob Rogers. She's married. I don't know her uh, married name. Can I have uh, an exhibit like to be marked as uh, defense uh, exhibit A? You so much. <laughs> Ms. Fields, from where you're positioned, I don't know if you can see uh, the exhibit uh, so that we can also let uh, the jurors see it. Can you see it from where you are? No. Uh, if I can ask the court's permission, if uh, Ms. Fields could uh, step down from the witness stand sure. to observe the document. Yes. Yeah. Have you had an opportunity to, uh, to look at the exhibit, Ms. Fields? Yes. And uh, do you recognize uh, what that exhibit is? Yes. You can return to your seat, ma'am. Uh, that exhibit, uh, which has now been marked as Defense Exhibit A, uh, is a uh, enlarged copy of the uh, lawsuit that's been filed on uh, your behalf as it relates to this incident. Is that correct? Yes. <coughs> and the uh, uh, name uh, of the uh, the party uh, on whose benefit uh, this particular uh, claim is filed is uh, solely in uh, your name, uh, Tracy Fields. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, you're aware that uh, this complaint uh, that was prepared uh, was completed and signed by your lawyer, uh, Robert McNeil, on uh, July 31st, 1998. Is that correct? Yes. <coughs> And you're aware that uh, the allegations uh, in uh, this uh, particular complaint uh, talk about uh, loss of earnings and uh, time away from your job uh, at the time that uh, this complaint was uh, completed. Is that correct? Object to relevance, Your Honor. <clears throat> no, I really, I didn't, I didn't read the... I just scanned through it. If it had that on there, I wasn't aware of it. Okay. Uh, the uh, beginning of the uh, document of the complaint, the first line after the caption, uh, indicates that uh, the plaintiff alleges. Uh, do you see that? Yes. And the, uh, the plaintiff in this particular case you've already uh, been discussing with me uh, is yourself, Tracy Fields. Yes. Uh, so this document uh, is saying that Tracy Field states uh, that uh, the things contained in this document are true. Is that correct? Yes. And some of the things that are contained in the document uh, relate to the fact that uh, you've missed work uh, and that you've lost uh, earnings uh, because of this incident. Yes. And this document would have been prepared uh, the day uh, after, or at least completed, 
because it was signed by your attorney on July 31st, less than 24 hours after this incident had taken place uh, on July 30th, 1998, sometime around 11 a.m. or noon. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, the information, therefore, that's contained in here with respect to uh, your missing time from work at the time that the complaint was prepared uh, is uh, not accurate. Would you agree with me? Can you repeat that again? The information uh, contained in the complaint that says that you've missed time away from work at the time that this document was signed by your attorney is not accurate. Yes, I was supposed to return to work the next day after the accident, the incident that happened. So, it, yes, it's, it's accurate. Okay. Uh, and you, uh, when you were given this, you read through and checked this for, uh, for accuracy uh, at the time that it was completed. Is that your testimony? No. Well, I didn't read thoroughly like I should have. So, no, that... I, I didn't read the whole um, complaint there. Were you physically intimidated uh, by the uh, stature uh, of my client at the time that uh, he was uh, next to you? Yes. And were uh, you uh, afraid of him uh, at that uh, particular time? Yes. You indicated you're approximately, uh, what, you indicated uh, five feet, uh, feet six inches? Yes. Okay. And uh, 205 pounds approximately at the time? Yes. Uh, and uh, how is uh, uh, my client's physical stature in relation to, uh, to your particular height and uh, weight? He went off on me. Okay. I, that's non-responsive. Right, motion to strike. What he's asking, ma'am, is... How's Mr. Coleman built compared to the way you're built? Yes, he's smaller than I am. Okay. Uh, would you say uh, considerably smaller? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> and what was it uh, that you say uh, made you uh, fear uh, my client uh, when he was next to you? His rage. Well, we will try to keep you posted on continuing developments in that trial of Gary Coleman. We'll bring you more highlights as time permits. But when we return, we'll be going down to Knoxville, Tennessee, where critical testimony is taking place in the trial. Welcome back to Court TV. I'm Ricky Kleeman. Many of you may remember that wonderful TV show, Different Strokes, where young child star Gary Coleman was part of our lives, and that's back in the 70s. Well, many years later, all the way up to last 1998 in July, he was a different person, now an adult and reduced to a different status in his life. He winds up getting into an argument in a store with a woman, winds up hitting her, but the real question is, was there some kind of self-defense? He's facing misdemeanor battery charges and a million dollar lawsuit. Well, Gary Coleman testified earlier today. We are going to go watch his testimony, but before we do that, we're going down to the Court TV News Center and our own Dan Broden. What we're going to do is this. We're going to squeeze in a commercial break now because we want to get to big chunks of that testimony of Gary Coleman from earlier today. We also are going to get an update from Time Magazine White House correspondent on the White House's reaction to what is going on in the Senate chamber. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Some of you may have tuned in yesterday and you found that we were not only looking at Washington, we were looking at our trial of an alleged serial killer in Knoxville, Tennessee, but we also moved on to Englewood, that is outside Los Angeles or part of Los Angeles, California, where actor Gary Coleman is on trial for a misdemeanor battery charge. But the problem he has is not six months in jail or perhaps a fine. The problem he has is he may be facing a mighty lawsuit indeed. Well, to get you all back in the country, yesterday we heard the testimony from Tracy Fields. She's the person who's the alleged victim in this case. Today the testimony came in from Gary Coleman. You missed it because we're dealing with impeachment. We are going to show it to you. I promise, I promise. We just want to do one more thing before we get to it. 
And that's because in our expanded impeachment coverage, we've been fortunate enough to work with White House correspondents from Time Magazine. And we have Karen Tumulty joining us now. So I promise I wasn't kidding you. We are going to hear Gary Coleman, and we're going to start right now. Let me tell you what point we are in the testimony. Coleman gets on the stand. He is called by his lawyer, Adam London. And he wants to begin at the beginning, of course. And what were his plans that day? And look. As you sit here in court today, uh, do you feel you have a uh, pretty good recollection of uh, what had transpired on that day? Absolutely. I'm an actor. It's my job to have a good recollection. <clears throat> have you been approached uh, since that time by uh, numerous members of uh, uh, media to, uh, to speak uh, with respect to this particular incident? Uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, I have not spoken to them. <clears throat> With respect to what you've heard uh, in the past uh, two and a half days of testimony, uh, everything you've heard from the prosecution witnesses, uh, would you say that, uh, as you recall it, it is all accurate? Somewhat. Okay. Uh, is your recollection different in uh, some respects? Absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> Can you describe for us briefly uh, your uh, plan on that particular day? What brought you into the California Uniform Store and where you were going? Uh, yes. Uh, on that particular day, uh, I was going in to get a bulletproof vest or something that I wanted. And uh, Rosemary had told me in a previous visit that she'd have one that day. So I went in to go pay for it. Um, it was about 11 o'clock. And did you have any uh, plans uh, after uh, you were going to uh, complete that errand at uh, that store? Uh, yes, I believe that day I had an interview with a newspaper. Okay. Not about this uh, issue, though. Okay. It was Some, obviously before that. Something which had been uh, prearranged uh, prior to uh, arriving at the store? Yes. When you arrived uh, at this store, uh, describe for us uh, what you did. Uh, the first thing I did was I noticed that uh, there were two people in the store ahead of me. And I was kind of in a hurry, but I was willing to wait because the vest was important to me. Um, I went to this side of the counter right about here, this little opening. I put my money and my keys right here. As we look at, uh, I believe, what's been marked as uh, People's Exhibit uh, 1, uh, there's the uh, the break in uh, the uh, long portion of uh, the counter. Uh, maybe you could persuade Mr. Uh, Lewin to uh, give you the use of this, or lend you the use of this pointer. All right, I'd be happy to use it. You want me to repeat that? No, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. And when you went to that particular area, did you uh, converse with anybody in particular? Uh, yes. Um, I said hello to Rosemary, and I said hello to Mahogany, even though I didn't know her name, but I recognized her. And uh, <laughs> I knew there were two other people ahead of me, and I said, do you have a vest for me? And I said it real fast, because, you know, I had my other appointment to get to. And Rosemary said to me, there's two people ahead of you. And I said... That's fine. I'm not in that big a hurry. I'm willing to wait. They were here first. And uh, anything unusual or anything significant happen at uh, about that particular time? Well, I had been in a store waiting for about, I don't know, a few moments, minute maybe, and uh, the uh, young lady, Miss Fields, was on the phone uh, talking about something. I wasn't really paying attention. And while she was on the phone, she called rather loudly across from here to where I was. Can I have your autograph? Just like that. When uh, you took a moment to, uh, to point uh, with the pointer to uh, People's Exhibit 1, uh, you were indicating uh, the area around where has previously been identified as the, uh, the bubblegum machine and where the, uh, the fax telephone is? That's correct. And I'm and, over here. Okay. And uh, when you heard... Uh, 
Well, did you, uh, when you, you heard this voice call out, uh, and uh, in, in, in the tone that you've described, uh, did you look in that direction? Did you, uh, did you take any notice of it? Um, I was actually counting my money, and it sent a chill up my spine. It just shocked me. Uh, it was so out of the blue and just loud, and it just, it, it, it bothered me. Had you been involved with a conversation with the person who had asked for your autograph before these words were shouted out? No. Okay. Uh, did you exchange any uh, pleasantries with this person or uh, cordial greetings uh, before this request was made? Not at all. Uh, did, you, uh, did you see or did you take note at some point uh, who was uh, speaking those words? Uh, yes. After It was a few seconds after I looked up and looked over and uh, saw the Miss Fields was looking at me. And I got kind of figured it came from her. <clears throat> when uh, you took note uh, of that, uh, what, if anything, did you do? Well, um, in the same few seconds, I thought, well, that was kind of rude, especially with somebody on the phone, probably hurt their ears. I'm going to go over there and sign the autograph for her. Okay. And uh, did you do that? Uh, yes, I did. When uh, you said you signed the autograph, did you leave uh, what you were doing and the conversation you were having with Rosemary and uh, walk uh, over to where this person was to, uh, to provide her the autograph? Uh, yes, Rosemary had finished with me and went back to one of her other customers. And uh, I was waiting a few seconds, and I left from this spot right here, close to the corner in, at, uh, of the break, and I walked right over here to this spot right here where there's a piece of paper, white or green piece of paper, uh, sitting right here on the counter. Why don't you indicate Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the witness indicated uh, he walked from uh, uh, the point at the break and the long portion of the counter, uh, walking alongside the counter. As you look at the photograph towards the left uh, and continuing towards the area, the short side of the counter where has been uh, the gumball machine is depicted. <clears throat> Was anything uh, at that time uh, when the autograph was asked for, was anything specific requested of you with respect to uh, what you should say or who you should make it out to? Uh, no, not at all. And uh, other than uh, at that moment uh, going to that particular position and uh, signing the autograph, were any other words exchanged between uh, you uh, and uh, Ms. Fields at that time? No, not at all. I just signed my name. And when you went over there uh, and signed your name as she had asked you to do, was she still on the phone, if you know? Uh, I believe so, uh, because I just signed it and I walked from the gumball machine wall where the counter ends area here back over to where I had left my items. Okay. Rex should reflect, uh, as the uh, witness had previously described, walking a certain point and path, now walking in the reverse direction. Uh, from uh, the area of the gumball machine towards his uh, original uh, position. <clears throat> and uh, when you went uh, back to uh, where you had left your personal belongings, your keys, and your money, uh, did you uh, do anything at that point? Uh, no, I just sat there and still waited to be serviced. And when you walked into the store, uh, can you describe for us uh, hearing the testimony of uh, Mahogany Speed with respect to how it appeared to her that you were feeling. How were you feeling on that particular day? Uh, I was feeling quite busy and uh, quite concentrated. I was concentrating on my whole day. I had a full day. Um, and sometimes it appears that I'm irritated or terse when I'm concentrating, but I'm not. So was he irritated? Was he terse? What made him snap? Did he snap? Or really was he pushed and shoved? Well, it's really a credibility contest here, no doubt about it. So we're going to let you be the judge as you continue to watch Gary Coleman testify after this break. Stay with us. Coleman was a child star in the TV show Different Strokes. This is back in the late 70s. He's now 30 years old. He is four foot eight inches tall. He weighs approximately 85 pounds. 
And it is said that back in July of 1998, he went into a store and he had an incident with a woman named Tracy Fields. Tracy Fields says that he attacked her. Now, Tracy Fields is five foot six inches tall. She weighs 205 pounds. The real question here is, was Gary Coleman the aggressor? And if he really was, a jury may find him guilty of misdemeanor battery. And if that happens, he's in big trouble. Because the day after this incident, the very next day, Ms. Fields filed a suit against him for one million dollars. We're looking at his testimony, and as we go into this next section, I just want to warn you, there is profane language in this particular section, and it is, of course, the words that are described were the words that were used when the two people did whatever they did to each other. So keep that in mind as you watch. Let me rephrase that. After you had walked back to, uh, to where you had left your personal belongings after you had signed the autograph, uh, did uh, uh, Tracy Fields say something else to you, uh, or did you hear something else spoken? Uh, yes, just before, just before I got to my arrival here, maybe like right about the cash register, she called across the room again quite loudly. Ain't you going to put nothing nice on it? I thought, you, that really rude but I just thinking that to myself and uh, I just left it alone I, mean, I just left it alone I didn't say anything I didn't go back and do anything <clears throat> after uh, you had uh, heard uh, that comment uh, did you do anything at that point or was there any further conversation um, after I got back to my belongings and started doing what I was doing with my belongings I said to her, uh, you really don't need that. You're just going to show it off to friends and whatever, and that is my signature. I didn't make it up. And uh, did she seem to be uh, satisfied uh, with, uh, with your response? Uh, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, she got a little bit irritated. Okay. And, uh, what was it about uh, uh, what you perceived? Uh, or what she, uh, how she acted uh, that uh, made you feel that she was irritated? Um, because the next thing she said to me was, you're just a rude badass. Okay. And I thought, really? Describe for us, if you can, the tone of voice uh, and the mannerisms in which uh, she expressed that to you. Well, she's a very large, buxom woman. Um, to me, I mean, just me, very attitudinal. Very, you know, I'm special, me first, you know, take care of me because I'm one of your fans and you should treat me like gold. It was that kind of attitude. And was that based on the way that uh, she had been addressing you? Yes. The tone and yes, the manner? Yes, like I'm supposed to kowtow to her. <clears throat> and after she had uh, uh, commented... Uh, to you with respect to your your, your badass attitude uh, did you uh, respond to that uh, yes I said uh, no actually you're very rude and I don't appreciate your tone and uh, I just I don't like that and I don't appreciate it and I'm sorry you're disappointed and that that's not good enough for you okay. and was that the end of the conversation at that point uh, no, the next thing she said was, well, that's why you didn't make it as a successful actor as an adult, or something like that. I may be paraphrasing. Okay. And uh, describe for us, if you can, uh, the uh, tone uh, and the, uh, the manner in which uh, those words were spoken to you. Oh, she made sure that uh, everybody in the store heard it. Uh, and uh, it was embarrassing. And uh, it was quite hurtful. But, you know, it's, that's it. I mean, uh, hurtful and embarrassment and, you know, her, her assumed value of the autograph, I decided she didn't need an autograph. And uh, did you then uh, do anything? I just went back over and retrieved it because it was still sitting on the uh, counter right here where the bubble gum machine is and the wall and, count and the doors over here. It was still sitting on the counter. I just went over, picked it up, tore it up and reached over the counter because I knew there was a trash can back there, tossed in the trash can. 
when you had uh, uh, walked uh, in, in that direction, uh, was it your intent at that point? Well, what was your intention at that point? Uh, just to remove the autograph from her possession. Uh, I felt she didn't deserve it. Okay. And when you went over there, uh, well, was there anything blocking your path uh, when you walked from uh, the area of the cash register towards where uh, Ms. Fields was? Uh, no, uh, I don't exactly remember where Ms. Waters was, but my path back over there to get the autograph was clear. Okay. And when you went uh, back to retrieve the autograph, uh, describe for us what you did, if anything. Uh, after I picked it up, tore it up, threw it in the trash, uh, she said, uh, uh, what the hell did she say? She said, uh, well, you're just a punk ass. You're just really rude. Uh, and, and then she finally said, fuck you. And uh, I'm not going to watch you on TV no more. When she was making these comments to you, where were you in relation to her? I had not left that, that spot yet right there. Okay. And uh, I had turned around and, you know, it's regrettable, but I turned around and I looked at her and said, no, fuck you, lady. Okay. And were you facing her at that time? Yes, I was facing the counter, tossed it in the trash, and I'm listening to her throw these mean, nasty words at her. And I know, I'm noticing her size, and I know from previous experience with dealing with really unruly fans that this is someone I don't want to deal with, and I really shouldn't be this close. When you described that she was in front of you and describing her closeness, is there some point of distance perhaps in the courtroom uh, or some other reference you can give us as to how close she was to you at that point in time? Uh, I'll use the uh, easel here. Um, this is the counter right here. She's right here, getting closer to me. I can is, feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. If I can ask, uh, the, the witness is standing before uh, an easel in the courtroom uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the front torso of his body touching the, uh, the easel. Are you referring to the easel uh, being the counter or, or, or being some other object? Uh, this is the counter and the door is right here about four feet away. Indicating behind you? Yeah, over here. And uh, at this point, uh, are you facing the counter or are you facing uh, Miss Fields? Um, uh, before or after she said, uh, I'm really rude and fuck you. Well, before she made the comments, Yeah. you were facing which direction? I was facing this way. I had just torn up the autograph and tossed it in the trash. Okay. And, uh, and after she well, had made... She says he's facing this way, you should describe which way. Uh, sir, please. You should describe which way he's facing for the record. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the witness, again, is uh, standing before the, uh, uh, before the object uh, replicating the counter as if uh, facing the counter. Okay. Uh, Sorry, Your Honor. After uh, she had made uh, the comments to you that she had just described, uh, is that when you turned? Uh, yes, and I turned and I looked up at her. She's about to me. You know, I'm four foot eight or nothing, 86 pounds or nothing. And I looked up at her and I said, no, fuck you, lady. And when you had made those comments back to her, uh, you were facing her at this point? Yes. And uh, was the counter to your back? The counter would now be at my back. And, and were you actually uh, against the counter, touching the counter? Well, um, after I said, fuck you, lady, she bristled and got a little huffy and said, no, fuck you, you little bitch. When... When you had first responded back to her, uh, fuck you, lady, and she was in front of you. Right. Uh, how close was she uh, to your front? Oh, there's maybe, I mean, I don't make, mean to make a joke, but her breasts were closer to me than any other part of her body. Uh, there was maybe an inch of daylight there. <clears throat> And in, in relation to you, uh, when you were standing there at that point, uh, how, how big uh, is she in relation to you? Uh, after seeing her in the court today and remembering July 30th, she was larger and meaner looking and she had a different hairstyle. She was scary. She was very scary. and. and She's not someone that I would normally be that close to. 
ever for any reason? When she had responded uh, by saying uh, something to the effect, as you had described, uh, fuck you, little punk, uh, how are you feeling at, uh, at that moment? Uh, I was getting scared. And don't ask me why, but my feet were not moving. I should have got away from that woman. <laughs> and uh, what was it about the situation, uh, if you can put yourself back in that particular situation, uh, that was frightening to you? Well, she kept getting closer, and she started looking very large to me and bigger, and I'm getting really scared, and there was only one way away from her, and she kind of sidestepped just a little bit to block my escape back over to my items, which, you know, stupid me, I still left on the counter for somebody to shoplift. So um, my concentration was to try and get away from her because she's getting really ugly and really mean and she was scaring me and I wanted my items. It was a, quite a bit of money on the counter. And, and what tone of voice was she using when she was making those most recent uh, derogatory comments to you? It's not an exaggeration when I would say she was shaking the ceiling tiles. That's what you felt? That's what I felt. When you were in this position, the counter was to your back. Uh, the wall, uh, which is shown in uh, People's Exhibit 1 with the uh, bubblegum machine, would have been on your right? That is correct. And she was uh, towards the front of you? Yes. I mean, she was facing into the store. I was facing the door. And she had sidestepped a little bit to prevent my escape back over here to the corner of the counter on this side here. And uh, after she had made those last uh, derogatory statements to you, uh, what uh, did you feel she was going to do next? Well, after she bristled and got a little huffy and blocked my path, I decided, well, uh, she looks like she wants to slap the taste out my mouth. And uh, I'm very small, very delicate, you know, I don't break easy, but I do break. And I was getting real scared, so I thought it's either fight or flee. So I thought if I distract her with a blow, I can flee. So I hit her. You felt that she was going to hit you? Yeah, first. And when you hit her, describe for us uh, what you did. Um, after I struck her, and I was shocked as hell that I did it, after I struck her, um, she reared back with her left arm, you know, she brought it back here, and I hit her with my left hand, which is the weakest arm and the weakest hand on my body. Are you uh, right-handed or left-handed? I'm right-handed. Okay. Uh, when you uh, describe it as being your, uh, the, the, the weakest arm, uh, is that personal for you? Uh, that's, it's been personal with me for about seven years now. Okay. And as many of you may know, Gary Coleman suffers from a congenital kidney problem, and he does have to have dialysis, and we may or may not hear from him that that, of course, may be part of the weakness in his arms. But you certainly did hear from him that he says in his fear, he went ahead and hit her, and he really did hit her because we saw the picture of the bruise yesterday. But the question is still going to be, was it self-defense? We're taking a break when we come back. More of Gary Coleman's testimony. Argument. Few names were called, few swears. On court TV. July 30th, 1998, a very large woman and a very small man had an argument. And at first it was a verbal argument. Few names were called, few swear words were used. But at some point, as these things often do, it escalated. Now, Gary Coleman, a former child actor who was actually quite famous in the late 70s doing different strokes, he is someone who has just admitted on the witness stand that, in fact, he did strike Tracy Fields, no doubt about it. He says he did it with his left arm, his weaker arm. But one of the things that the jury has to consider is what were the states of mind of these two people? Who was scared of whom? And, of course, 
all of that has to do with the size. So let's take a look at these two people side by side. Now this happened at about 5.15 Eastern time in the courtroom today. And what happened was the lawyer for Gary Coleman asked his client, who is four foot eight, approximately 85 pounds, to stand next to the complaining witness. Her name is Tracy Fields. Well, Tracy Fields is five foot six, 205 pounds. Now, it certainly has been said in this particular case that perhaps that is the most important fact of all for decision. Because a jury might believe Tracy Fields, they might believe Gary Coleman, or some of what each of them say, but you've got to look at the size of both of them, and is it going to carry the day? Well, we heard Tracy Fields testify live yesterday. Gary Coleman testified live this morning, but we're putting this in order because we know you want to hear him. We're going back to his tale of the day. He talks about his fear. He talks about the words that were exchanged. Again, this section of his testimony does have profane language. Uh, before we had broke, you were describing uh, the uh, words uh, that were being spoken uh, by Ms. Fields to you uh, before you uh, swung at her. Uh, can you describe for us uh, what it was uh, that uh, made you feel that uh, you had to uh, swing uh, at that time? Well, as she had sidestepped and somewhat cut off my escape back this direction where I had my items, which would be from the gumball machine to the break and counter, um, and she was crowding me and getting huffy. And she said, fuck you, little bitch. Uh, I was scared. And she swelled up and balled up her fist. I'm like, this can't be happening. This just can't be happening. So uh, knowing my only avenue of escape definitely can't go out the door because she's blocking the door. My only avenue of escape was to go through the path she had cut off. So I hit her. Uh, did you feel that... Uh she was going to uh, uh, attack you at that point? Is that why you acted that way? It was something other than the hair standing up on my neck. It was some instinct, something inside of me said, this woman is unreasonable and I'm getting scared and I'm too small to fight her. Uh, 205, 250 pounds, I don't know how much she weighed, but she was too large to take on. <clears throat> And was your feeling uh, that she was going to act in that way, uh, in part based on the words that she was speaking to you? Right, and the, just the volume over a signature that even the IRS don't give me a break on. <clears throat> at some point after you had uh, swung at her, uh, describe for us uh, what happened. Uh, the, 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 the swing was this way on the left side of her head or yeah uh, no actually the, yeah left side of her head uh she grabbed me by the neck and held me and she pulled her left arm back and had it up and she was shaking it and i grabbed the arm that had me by the neck because if i keep hold of this arm uh i can keep her off balance and she had her purse on that arm. And I pulled away from her. I kept backing up, backing up, backing up. And I kept getting lower and lower and lower so that she can't strike. And I kept her off balance that way until my butt was on the floor. And then she got on her knees. And in that motion, and we're going, oh, by the way, we're going from here to about a two-foot, three-foot movement back this way. We never went this way or this way. I see. You have to keep the record current. Thank you, Your Honor. The uh, witness is indicating with laser pointer on uh, People's Exhibit 1, uh, indicating an area around uh, the short end of the counter uh, where the uh, gumball machine is. And uh, when the statements were made not indicating uh, this way, it was towards the uh, longer part of the counter where the break in the counter is. Right. Uh, we ended up about mm, three, four feet maybe this way. Uh, toward the bottom of this photograph. Um, she, her purse had slipped, because I had her, and at one point this arm came loose, and the purse had slipped down and ended up over here. Uh, 
indicating uh, uh, your yeah. uh, left arm? Yeah, this is my left arm. Okay. The purse slid down, yeah, down her right arm onto my left arm. Okay. And that's how I ended up with the purse. Uh, did you, uh, you recall the Mahogany Speed's testimony that she was uh, swinging uh, her bag or her purse out uh, at you? Do you recall that? Right. That was before I grabbed that arm. She hit me on the head with it. It's a soft, cheap, non-leather purse, about this big with two little loop handles. At some point, uh, how did this uh, scuffle uh, end? Um, after I, my butt hit the floor and... I kept backing up and backing up on the floor until she let go of my neck. Finally, this officer, whoever this officer Waters was, stepped in between after she had let go of me. Were the two of you standing at that point or were you? No, the I was ground? still on the floor after she stepped in between. She was still on her knees. After she had stepped in between, I got up and I had the purse. Uh, did you ever, uh, after. Uh, uh, Emily Waters had separated uh, the two of you and you'd got up off the floor. Did you ever try to uh, run back or push back uh, to get back at, uh, at Miss Fields? No, we, were, we, we got into another heated thing where she said, I'm going to get my family to come get you and all of this nonsense and uh, more fuck yous and you know you're just a little punk bitch and all of that and uh i may have wanted to but thank god sense prevailed and uh i dropped the purse on the floor and walked back over here to where my stuff was thank god it was still there because uh, in actuality it was a, another person over in this part of the store off the picture that I didn't know, and he was over there shopping. Record should reflect as we're looking at uh, People's Exhibit Number One, uh, which depicts only the uh, counter area of the store. The witness is indicated pointing off towards what would be the right side of the photograph as you look at the photograph, uh, indicating with reference to somebody else being inside of the store. <clears throat> During the uh, the. Uh, verbal slings that were uh, being lobbed at you from uh, Ms. Fields, the profanity that you've described. Uh, if you know, was uh, Emily Waters, was she uh, uh, somewhere in the vicinity, if you know, or within the store? You know, I don't mean to insult the woman, but for a police officer, she was oddly unpresent during that whole incident from beginning to when it was basically over. Based on uh, your opinion, uh, listening to uh, the words and the tone uh, and how loud uh, Ms. Fields was speaking to you, do you think anybody inside the store uh, would have heard uh, the profanity-laced comments that uh, she was uh, directing at you? I remember, uh, I don't think he, anybody has a record, but I remember a couple of the seamstresses. There's a seamstress sewing area in the rear of the store. I remember looking back and seeing uh, the seamstress and I think the janitor look out from the room back there just to see what the hell was going on. The, uh, the tone that she was using, the loudness of it, uh, do you think people who are in the main part of the store, which has been described, uh, which is shown in uh, photograph uh, one, the other photographs which have been introduced, do you think they would have heard uh, this profanity? Oh, definitely. I mean, we're talking about people that are two back here, this is the register, but they were not at the register here. They were more this way towards the front door. Both of them right next to each other with their mouths agape. Uh, the, the officer never really left this general area down here in the bottom of the picture uh, from the door over here towards the uh, larger part of the store. She just didn't get involved. Um, and then her and I were in the front door short counter area right here by the bubblegum machines and like i said uh as the yelling because we're yelling now escalated the uh, seamstress and the janitor peeked out from back here off the picture which is about i don't know 20 feet 30 feet okay. so i mean for them to peek out it's loud <clears throat> you, you had described yourself as being uh four feet, uh, eight inches tall, and approximately uh, 86 pounds. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, is that, uh, was that your physical stature uh, back uh, last summer, July 30th, 1998? Uh, 
Yeah, because I went through a period where I'd lost a little late, a little bit of weight. So I might have been a little bit smaller. As far as your uh, physical shape, as it relates to your strength, uh, how would you characterize your, your upper body strength, your strength in your arms? I'll be overall. Um, well, I'll tell you this. When I was eight, I could lift a 20 pound. Sir, sir, please yeah. answer, answer the question. I, I, I'm sorry, sir. I was going to. Yes, uh, with respect to uh, your strength uh, in your uh, upper body, how would you characterize it? Very minimal. I bowl with an eight pound bowling ball with my right hand. <clears throat> How strong did uh, Ms. Fields appear to you uh, when you were confronted with her and uh, after she had uh, grabbed your body? Um, uh, like I said, I don't want to insult nobody, but she seemed, especially when her breasts were hitting me on the forehead, she seemed squishy and her hands were large and squishy. And uh, not to say that she could not have hurt me uh, because she was angry. And I'm sure a little bit of adrenaline was flowing. So uh, I didn't want to tangle with her, no matter how large or squishy she was. Did you feel like she could hurt you? <laughs> Absolutely. Or at least smother me. Well, it's an interesting way of expressing your fear in a self-defense case. I, I have to say, with all the self-defense cases that I've ever tried or watched, I don't think I've heard the term squishy used, but it is used here. And, of course, we have to look at how tiny Gary Coleman is. Well, as you know, when there is direct examination, there is cross as well, particularly of a defendant. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll hear that cross-examination. As wide as the courtroom? Mm, a little narrower. You had no injuries that day as far as your legs, no physical injuries? No. No reason you couldn't run? Uh, no. Okay. And we, we talked a lot about Miss Fields' size. We, we've seen Miss Fields, we've seen you. Would it be fair to say that in a foot race, you would probably be able to get away from Miss Fields? Not necessarily. Okay. Why don't you expound on that? I don't run very fast. Okay. I'm guessing by the way you describe Ms. Fields that she probably also does not run too fast. Would you agree with that? I would. Okay. So you'd have a fair chance in a foot race with her? Maybe. And ample room to run in that store? Uh, without her cutting off my route of escape, yes. Okay. Now, you made a big issue about her request for an autograph and the volume of her voice, correct? Yes. And she basically demanded... In your, in your, at least the way you took it, she demanded an autograph from you. Uh, the way I heard it, and the way it was actually spoken by her, uh, there was no asking about it. Okay. And you've been an actor for 20 years, you said? That's right. Okay. I'm not an actor. I don't have anyone ever asking for my autograph, but I got to think in 20 years, that is kind of a common thing for people to, in a sense, be sort of rude and sort of demanding when they see you and ask for an autograph. That, Not to that extent. I don't think I've ever had it that bad. But you have had people that, when you walk by somewhere, people shouting out, Gary, 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 and trying to hand things to you, kind of like the way you'd see Mark McGuire or a sports figure? It's not like the same. It's not the same with actors and sports figures. Okay. Well, then other actors, George Clooney, you've seen, you've had people be demanding to you before. Of course. But, just in different tones of voice and a hell of a lot nicer. Okay, but this one shocked you so much. You said the hair on your back stood up. You were scared immediately when she when she addressed you. Uh, no, that's not correct. Okay, maybe, what did I what did I? Uh, when she said, "Can I have your autograph?" <laughs> Hollering from here to here where I was, that I was. Just for the record, where he pointed. Your Honor, he's pointing to I assume her being by the gumball machine and Mr. Coleman being by the break in the counter. Uh, well, she hollowed over the that distance, um, that to me, and said it in that tone with somebody on the phone, those are, those are two things that shocked me, that she would just say it so loudly, because I prefer it a little bit more discreet, and hurting the ears of the person on the telephone, 
that was just uh, uncalled for. Well, of course, being shocked at what was going on and being scared that is so frightened that you felt you couldn't retreat and that you had to go hit. Those are two different things. And, of course, that's where the prosecutor is going. The prosecutor has an interesting tact. The very first thing Gary Coleman said was that he was an actor. The prosecutor capitalized on that about an actor being good with recollection as well as rehearsal and performance. Well, there's going to be more performance in just a minute. We're going to take a break. More cross-examination on the other side. Welcome back. So what really happened? On July 30th, 1998, in a store where little Gary Coleman, child actor, who says he is not only a child actor, but has continued acting, but we remember him from different strokes, he's pretty small. And he and a large woman named Tracy Fields had a little verbal problem with each other. Well, eventually that problem, according to the defendant, made him so scared, so frightened, that he went and whacked Tracy Fields. Well, the only way he's getting out of this one is if the jury believes he's, his fear, believes it really was self-defense. Well, why was he scared? Well, he said she was squishy and she might smother him. Well, we're going back in to look in his testimony during cross-examination. At some point, Miss Fields, after she asked for the autograph, you walked over to her and That's you wrote, right. you signed your name. Right. And you're saying that before you even walked away, she wanted something else put there. Right. When I about got about here, where this register is, she... I'm sorry. He is pointing to the register on the middle of the photo, to the right side of the photo. Okay. Um, when I got about there, uh, she yelled out loudly again, um, ain't you going to put anything nice on it? Just real street like that. I mean, I am not street, but I mean, just real agnitudinal and somewhat like, you know, I want more. Aren't you? Don't you give more? It was that kind of a thing. Were you afraid of her at that point? No, I was actually shocked that she'd be that rude and that much more rude a second time. So you walked over, and at that point, you, you ripped the autograph up. No. Uh, the, all the words of being rude and that I'm a badass punk and all of the uh, insults started before I got over there. Okay. At some point, maybe I'm mixing up your testimony and the other people's testimony, but we'll move through this. At some point, you said that you had a problem with someone saying, she says, or she, her feeling like, I'm a fan, give me what I want, give me an autograph. I don't have a problem with that. It's just that some fans are <laughs> extremely pushy and demanding and take it to the ninth level. Unfortunately, this happened to be one of those. You didn't like the fact, though, I think you said that I'm special, I'm one of your fans, I should get an autograph. You didn't like her attitude from the start. No. She makes a statement to you about being a child actor versus being an adult star or being an adult actor. And you, you said at that point that was embarrassing and, and hurtful to you. Yeah, it's correct? embarrassing and hurtful because it's not true. Okay. You're testifying differently from the other witnesses, but that at that time you were actually standing right next to her. Uh, by the time all of these jabs finished, I had decided to go get the autograph. So you weren't afraid of her at that point? No, I just wanted to get the autograph away from her. Even though there had been jabs thrown, she was much bigger than you. She was argumentative and rude. You were not afraid to go up and take the autograph from her? Not at that point. And you weren't afraid to rip it up in front of her? No. I wanted her to know that she was not going to have it. And throw it out in front of her and continue standing next to her? Well, after I thrown it out and she said, fuck you, you little punk bitch, uh, I turned around and said, fuck you, lady. <laughs> of course, I regret that now because she cut off my route of escape. And now, the way you had discussed it on direct, it sounded like you were saying she was actually, her back was to the gumball machine, and there was nothing behind you. No. No, no, no. She was blocking the door. Her back was facing this door over here. I'm in front of her, facing the counter, when she says, fuck you, you little bitch. And I turn around in this same spot without moving, and I look up at her 
face, her large, angry face. She's starting to bristle, and I say, fuck you, lady. When you turn around, she's right on you, correct? Right. Her breasts are touching your chest, or, or touching her, your yeah. face. <laughs> yeah, I think you got the general idea. Okay. And still, at that point, you're saying that you were kind of trapped in there. Right, and that's the, the hair bristling on the neck time. Okay. She had already been rude to you. She had already been demanding to you. And still, standing right next to her, you look up at her and you say, fuck you. Yeah, 30-year-old male. What do you expect? Okay, so, you, so you weren't that afraid of her? Well, I was, I was shocked. And I was getting scared. And she had cut off my route by pivoting. And, you know, I was stuck. Okay, shock, stuck, and getting scared, but not afraid at that time. Yeah, I don't find any difference between being afraid and being scared. Okay, or what about between getting afraid and being, or getting scared and being afraid? Uh, that didn't ha happen until she pivoted, and she swelled up, and she balled up her fist, and she said, fuck you, to me again, and I'm thinking, okay, this is ugly, She's balled up her fist. She's cut off my route of escape. Right, I'm going to cut you off. I'm just going to ask you. I'm going to try and ask you. Finish the question, the answer. I believe it's actually a yes or no question, Your Honor. Well, you may explain his answer. Go ahead, finish your answer. Thank you. Um, she cut off my route of escape, and I did not want that woman to put her hands on me. I didn't want her to press me against the counter. And I, at that point, I wanted to leave get the hell away from her, get my stuff, which is still over here, which would have kept me in the store. Sorry about that. Um, and leave. My intention was to leave and get away from her, get my stuff, and leave. But that was not going to happen. You're working as a security guard right now, correct? Uh, no. Or you have worked in the past as a security guard? Yes, I was a shift supervisor for other guards. Okay, you work for Sergeant Lucas? Who the hell is Sergeant Lucas? Do you know of a Sergeant Lucas, Fox Hills Mall? Oh, oh, huh. uh, yeah, I used to work there, too, as a shift supervisor. Okay. As part of your training as a security guard, you did go through training, correct? Uh, twice. Went up to La Puente and, or down to wherever La Puente is? And... No, 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 not that kind of training. I've known how to, I've known how to be a guard for the last 10 years. You never, you've never gone to specialized training classes? No, I know no hand-to-hand -hand combat. You have a guard card in California? Though. I have a California guard card, California baton card. And that does require, baton requires, definitely requires baton classes, correct? Yes, I went to Compton. Okay, and to get a guard card, you have to have some type of training in at least negotiating or uh, some form of hand-to-hand, -hand, not combat, but hand-to-hand. Uh, maneuvers? Uh, the training I received is very limited because that's what it is. It's limited. You're not supposed to be fighting people under the laws of the state of California and the county of Los Angeles. We're not supposed to fight nobody. Okay. Well, that's why we're here. But you're also not supposed to, well, you learn, I guess, alternate dispute resolutions in these types of training courses, correct? Uh, no. I took a written test. You take a written test. Some form, some way you've dealt with negotiating with people. No, yeah, you'd be nice to them. Be nice to them. Yeah. And you've had experiences in the past where you've been called in on some type of incident as a security guard where you've had a person who was bigger than you where you've had to take some sort of measure to either calm them down or deal with them in some way, correct? Thankfully, no. And if it ever came to that, I'd just call a bigger guard. How long were you a security guard? Uh, under six months. Six months? You've never had to deal with anyone bigger than you? That was... No. No. Well, you would agree, just common sense-wise, there are ways to deal with someone besides hitting them or running. Uh, depends on the situation. You weren't there. In a situation where a woman is asking for an autograph, demanding an autograph, there's always the option of giving her a customized autograph, correct? No. I've never given a customized autograph in 20 years. Okay, so rather than give a customized autograph, you'd rather punch the woman. <laughs> no. But that your hand does work, it can, it can write best wishes or it can write something customized, correct? It depends on how nice the person is. So if the person's not nice, then instead of doing a customized autograph, 
hitting her is a another acceptable route to getting away. <laughs> no. That seems inconsistent to me. You're t I'm asking you in this. Council uh, to avoid from uh, the uh, the personal uh, statements. Uh, council's not testifying. Uh, try to avoid personalizing your questions. Thank you, Your Honor. You could, in this situation, there was nothing stopping you from signing an autograph for this woman at that point. Nothing physical stopping you from signing an autograph. Well, um, I just have to stop you and ask you, what are you actually asking me? I don't understand. I'll make it real clear. Your, your hand was working at the time. You had nothing wrong with your arm, correct? I write with my right hand. Okay. If that's what you're asking. Nothing wrong with your right hand? No. You'd already signed an autograph. After... Yeah, after she had rudely asked for it, yes. There's nothing physical stopping you from either signing another autograph in a custom way or changing that autograph if you hadn't ripped it up to a more personalized autograph, correct? Just physically, there's nothing stopping you from that. If it was a different person other than Tracy Fields, yeah. Okay, so that's where I'm getting. So since it was Tracy Fields, that was not an option? Uh, no. Okay. She had made that choice. Okay. And you claim that we're getting back to where she was standing when you hit her. She was standing right on you, you said. Yep. Okay, now you saw Miss Field when she was standing in here, or when she when she testified. Yeah, she's a little smaller now. A little smaller. Yeah. Okay, but she stood up next to me. You saw that when she stood next to me? Yeah. Okay. And we looked to be about the same height, or could you tell? Actually, from my point of view over there in the defense chair, she looked a little taller than you. Okay. Just a little. That's fine. Well, I'm going to ask you now if you can stand down. I want you to just reach up and show the jury that you can actually reach my face or maybe over my face. All right. Well, that's all the time that we have for tonight. And I promise we'll catch up with this trial and the murder trial of Thomas Husky tomorrow. And right now, stay tuned for another edition of Pros and Cons. I'm Ricky Kleeman for everyone here at Court TV. Have a great evening. As the pint-sized star of Dick Rogues, Gary Coleman was a big celebrity for over eight years. Now he may become California's newest celebrity inmate. Gary Coleman faces six months in prison for allegedly punching a fan. And now a jury will decide, is the former child star guilty of battery or is he just having a stroke of bad luck? It's even... An eyewitness on that day, Coleman wasn't the charming boy he portrayed on television years before. He seemed to be in the irritable mood when he came in. Today, Coleman said he just had a lot on his mind at the time and that looks can be deceiving. Sometimes it appears that I'm irritated or terse when I'm concentrating, but I'm not. He also accuses Fields of inciting the incident with a brash manner and imposing figure. Breasts were hitting me on the forehead. She seemed squishy and her hands were large and squishy and uh, not to say that she could not have hurt me uh, because she was angry and I'm sure a little bit of adrenaline was flowing so uh, I didn't want to tangle with her. When asked why he didn't just run from his fields, Coleman who was last employed as a mall security guard says he was rooted to the ground with fear. I was getting scared and don't ask me why but my feet were not moving I should have got away from that woman. Coleman, who faces six months in jail, claims that in 20 years of show business, he's never encountered anyone like Tracy Fields. Well, Greg, it's a real he says, she said grud ma grudge match, and I think Coleman may need a stroke of luck for this one. Mm, I see the she deserved it defense <laughs> coming up. I decided... Well, uh, she looks like she wants to slap the taste out of my mouth. And uh, I'm very small, very delicate. You know, I don't break easy, but I do break. And I was getting real scared, so I thought it's either fight or flee. And so Gary Coleman, the former child star of the television show Different Strokes, chose to fight. Good morning. Welcome to the Courtroom Television Network. I'm Raymond Brown. The state of California charged Coleman with battery after he struck a woman in the face. This morning, we're going to bring you closing arguments as well as the outcome of that trial. 
We've also been covering a very unusual murder trial from Tennessee. Thomas Zuman Husky is accused of killing foreign women and dumping their bodies in a remote area near Knoxville, Tennessee. Coverage of that trial, the one of Thomas Husky, in about a half hour when it resumes. In the meantime, we're going to show you the conclusion of a California trial. We've also been bringing you sandwiched between Husky and the president's impeachment for the last two days. Child television star Gary Coleman was charged with battery after he hit a woman in the face. Tracy Fields says she was merely seeking an autograph for her son when Coleman became belligerent and attacked her. But Coleman claims it was Fields who started the altercation. The diminutive former actor points out that Fields is much larger than he is, and when she became aggressive, he says he was acting in self-defense. The trial concluded yesterday. We're going to bring you highlights of closing arguments and the conclusion of the trial. First, of course, we've got to take a break. Welcome back to Court TV. I'm Raymond Brown. Now, if you're old enough to have been watching television in the late 70s or the early 80s, or if you've seen a fair number of reruns, you may know about the sitcom Different Strokes, and you may know about Gary Coleman, one of the stars of that show. Well, he was charged with assaulting a woman who'd asked for his autograph in California. We brought you that trial for the last couple of days. Yesterday, the trial ended. Here's the closing argument of his defense counsel. Go through the facts. What I'm going to do is narrow this case down, make it very, very simple for you. Because in essence, it's a very simple case, a misdemeanor battery case. I'm going to knock it down to one basic question for you. You heard, you heard two stories, essentially two stories, three witnesses from the people, and you heard from the defendant. Two stories that are inconsistent on the, on the main issue of the case. You hear about other stuff, there were some consistencies, everyone was in the uniform shop, that's not argued. But you heard two different stories about what actually happened in there. And it's your job right now to decide who is telling the truth. And it's very simple. If you think the people's witnesses are telling the truth, then Mr. Coleman is guilty. If you think Mr. Coleman's telling the truth, then you have to find him not guilty. It's very simple. I could probably sit down right now and leave you with that. Maybe you'd like me to, but I want to go through some instructions first. Because now that you know the law, I mean, I'm sorry, now that you know the facts, you have to apply the law. And we discussed that during voir dire, during the, the uh, jury selection. And each of you, I think Mr. London asked you, why would you be a good juror? And what many of you said is, you know what, I'd be a good juror because I can take facts, I can apply them to law, I can knock out sympathy and emotion. I'm fair, be fair to both parties. And that's all we're asking from you right now, be fair to both parties. So I want to go through... The applicable law in this case, I don't, I don't know where my pointer is, so I'm going to point with my hand. But the first instruction you're going to have is a battery instruction. Now, you're going to have these instructions with you, so you don't need to worry about getting it all down right now. I'm going to point out just some parts that are relevant. Battery, pretty simple crime. One and two right here. Person used force violence upon another, and that use of force was willful and unlawful. First question when you read that is, what is force or violence? You got an instruction on that. Force or violence, and again, it's a long instruction. I've highlighted the important parts. Any unlawful application of physical force. Now, by unlawful, that refers to self-defense. We'll get into that later. It is lawful if it is, if it is force and violence used in self-defense which in the end is what this case is really about, is was this in self-defense, was it not in self-defense? Force and violence, even though it causes no pain or bodily harm or leaves no mark. Now, you've seen the photo of Ms. Fields in this case. And I'm gonna t I, uh, admit to you, I think I told you during opening statement, this is not a, it's not a murder, it's not a, there, no one got shot, there's no blood and guts, it is a black eye. Is it a million dollar black eye? I mean, that's not for you to determine, that's a civil suit. It is a black eye, it is a force, it is, it is the result of force or violence applied to Ms. Fields. And I don't think anyone disagrees with the fact that Mr. Coleman caused that. So that is force and violence. Now, what brought that on with Mr. Coleman? Why did he approach her? What we have is an exchange of words. We have Miss Fields saying at one point, you know what, you got a badass attitude. We got some other exchanges of words. She's demanding, she's rude. She apparently 
shocked the hell out of Mr. Coleman requesting an autograph. In 20 years, he's never heard someone so rude. But everything she did was statements. She made statements. Give me an autograph. Uh, I don't remember all the statements she made that Mr. Coleman testified to, but in the end, she made her one kind of famous or fatal statement. You know what? Maybe the reason you're not an adult star, or maybe your attitude is the reason you are not an adult star, you're a former child actor. Now, granted, if, if you're going back and you had two weeks to try and think of a hurtful thing to say to Mr. Coleman, you may not be able to come up with something. I mean, that's a pretty hurtful thing to say. And he testified to it. It, it hurt his feelings. It was hard to hear. On the other hand, if you're going back, you may not be able to think of a more accurate thing to say about Mr. Coleman. And the fact that Miss Field said that, from the people's witnesses, we know that was what led to this battery. He walked over, 14, I believe, 14 feet from the time that statement was made. Three witnesses put him 14 feet away. He walked 14 feet over, walked right up to her with no warning at all, and hit her in the eye and continued to hit her. Words alone. Words alone, not sufficient. Now, I mentioned, I mentioned the witnesses in this case. People had Emily Waters, LAX police officer, Tracy Fields, the victim, and Mahogany Speed. <clears throat> Mahogany was the clerk in the store. It is your job to listen to the witnesses in this case, including Mr. Coleman, who is a witness, decide, based on what they said, do you believe them? And as I said, that is your case. Do you believe these people? Do you believe this person? And the court instructs you on some of the things you can look at in, in uh, deciding if a witness is being credible, if they're telling the truth. And I want to point out a couple of them. One of them is the existence or non-existence of bias. We heard a lot in the cross-examination of Tracy Fields about this lawsuit. There is a civil lawsuit here. There is a civil lawsuit for an enormous amount of money. It's a million, I think it's a million dollars. You'll, you'll have it in back with you. It has nothing to do with this case. If you find Mr. Coleman guilty, Ms. Fields does not win a million dollars. You're not giving her a million dollars. This is not a civil suit. It's a criminal suit. The fact that this suit was filed the next day, although it seems maybe ridiculous that you'd file a suit the next day, maybe embarrassing that you would ask for a million dollars for a black eye, it is beside the point in this case. Someone gets hit, they got hit. Doesn't matter if the next day they sue the, the person that did it, they tell the world, they keep it to themselves, whatever happens, it doesn't matter, it doesn't affect the actual incident, it doesn't affect what happened. And in this case, despite all the cross-examination on Miss Fields about this civil suit and about her prayer for damages, all the different things she's asking for, medical, etc., it's a red herring. It's a way to tell you, you know what, don't like her, don't trust her, because after this happened, she's trying to get money. And she probably is trying to get money. She, I think she... She got up there, she said she was humiliated by this. She is trying to get something for it. Now, some of you may sit there and say, you know what, million dollars, that's crazy. She doesn't deserve a dime. I don't like her. I don't think she deserves anything. Some of you may say, you know what, Gary Coleman did that to me. I want five million bucks. I want whatever I can get from him. The bottom line is, it doesn't matter what you think because point in time, that happened after the incident that we're here on. Now, that was obviously the prosecutor. I said it was the defense attorney. I should be sitting backwards in my chair this morning. But in any event, um, I ask you to forgive me. And if you don't, you'll at least be happy to know that we've dragged Casey Jordan, who is a criminologist who's from John Jay College. You're really here to talk about Husky, but we grabbed you out of the green room and said, come talk to us about Gary Coleman. Uh, kind of interesting. First of all, how people relate 
to people they perceive as celebrities. It's, right. it's a kind of intimacy that they wouldn't dream of having with any other person who's a stranger. And I suppose that creates some lack of clarity about the spaces between people. Right. You can kind of understand on both sides of the fence here. Uh, there is a presumption that famous people will just love the attention and will just be flattered that you ask for their autograph. Uh, but then again, if you put yourself in the shoes of the former celebrity, it's it's a sensitive issue. Yeah, former famous people may feel yes. much different than currently famous people. Exactly. I mean, currently famous famous people need that attention and flattery to continue to bolster their careers. Gary Coleman, by his own admission, is, is washed out at the age of 30. He hasn't, he didn't do anything after different strokes. He's working as a security guard in the mall, which I think would uh, perhaps be the subject of some embarrassment or sensitivity. And uh, of course, the, the allegations are that she almost, his side of it is that she almost badgered him. She wasn't happy with the autograph. I mean, he, he complied with her request. He wasn't happy. And she wants more. And not to justify his alleged conduct, but certainly when you say to a guy who was doing well and then somehow had his star fall into the ocean, well, gee, you know, this is obviously the reason why you're not what you used to be. You're probably touching a pretty sensitive nerve. Yeah, I, I would even argue that's hitting a little below the belt. And we can understand that she, she was miffed, you know, she, according to the other witnesses, the managers of the store, she was pleasant. She asked it in an amicable way. She, she didn't demand it. Uh, it was when he got an attitude that she got an attitude and then of course the whole incident escalated so uh, obviously the lessons are first of all we probably shouldn't be violent in our responses no matter what but also uh, somebody who is in a position of great esteem before but seems to have fallen probably needs to be told there is some value now I, I suspect that's a nice assessment. I mean, I, I, I think that what happened is that Tracy Fields may have been one of perhaps hundreds of people uh, and perhaps was the one that broke, the straw that broke the camel's back for Gary Coleman. He was just tired of hearing people from people that he was uh, a has-been. So it's so the cumulative effect when you're on way, your way to work and you get a flat tire and then your car gets banged and four other things happen and you get to your building and somebody says good morning and, and now, you growl. That's right. It's sort of the cumulative effect of all the other things sure, that Sure, and happened. then we go inside and the dog and I you know sure Gary Coleman should have turned and walked out of that store but I'm sure in his mind he had a right to be there he had a right to shop without being harassed uh, by Tracy Fields I'm sure that's how he interpreted her actions in his mind um, and it will be interesting to see the outcome because he's gonna claim the self-defense but even with her insults, it, it, the attack appeared unprovoked. But as we have said in other contexts, the interface between the world of psychology and the mind and the law are not always uh, good meshes because the law says it almost doesn't matter what happens. If there's not a direct threat, you can't touch people without permission. Yep. Um, psychology, more nuanced, more interested in the motives and the hows and whys. And sometimes those worlds intersect effectively, but lots of times they don't. That's true. Well, we're going to be taking a break. Um, when we come back, we'll be hearing from the defense attorney. Uh, that's a man named Adam London who gave closing remarks in which he reminded the jury that the alleged victim, Tracy Fields, has filed a civil case against his client. It's obvious that Ms. Fields has a financial interest in the outcome of this case. The outcome of this case uh, would affect uh, the position that she has in the other case which she has initiated. Welcome back to Court TV. I'm Raymond Brown. Former child actor Gary Coleman was charged with battery after he hit an autograph seeker in the face. After all the evidence was presented to the jury, Prosecutor Jeff Lewin gave his closing statements. Among other things, he told the jury that the fact that the alleged victim has filed a civil suit against Coleman is irrelevant. Defense Attorney Adam London then gave his version in his closing remarks. It's obvious that Ms. Fields has a financial interest in the outcome of this case. The outcome of this case uh, would affect uh, the position that she has in the other case which she has initiated. Now, is it incredible to anybody else or just me? The fact that she goes and talks to a lawyer for 20 or 30 minutes about this instance, uh, and initially at least she testified that uh, they didn't discuss the possibility or they didn't discuss the litigate, they didn't discuss preparing a complaint or filing a civil complaint. Uh, and she made it seem as if that this was something that was just done uh, at the uh, uh, individual uh, direction uh, without her knowledge, really, uh, by her attorney. It's, it's not believable. 
<clears throat> Emily Waters uh, is, is interesting in, in the respect that she certainly didn't act as one of us would expect uh, or hope a police officer would act uh, if they were in this type of situation. She certainly didn't uh, do anything uh, during the time that the uh, conversations or arguments and profanity is being uh, uh, sling one way uh, back and forth uh, to uh, try to soften or try to uh, quell the dispute that was happening. Uh, she, she described herself as, uh, when this incident was taking place as far as the physical uh, altercation, uh, that she kind of just thought it was comical. She thought it was funny. She was looking around for cameras. I just ask you to consider what reason Emily Waters comes to come in here uh, and to paint such a soft picture of Tracy Fields. I mean, what, what is, there, there, there has to be uh, some type of a underlying uh, interest, bias, motivation uh, when she indicates that, you know, Tracy Fields was a complete lady. Uh, and when she asked for the autograph, she was polite and she didn't really raise, she never rose, uh, raised her tone of voice. And she certainly never used any profanity. Uh, and she didn't uh, try to uh, hit uh, or uh, re retaliate uh, against uh, Mr. Coleman after the altercation had begun. But we know those things aren't true. Uh, because we know from the 911 tape uh, where uh, Ms. Waters was standing right next to her during the time, uh, she's using profanity. Uh, you'll have the tape with you. Uh, you know through uh, Ms. Field's own testimony she's using profanity. You know, through uh, Mahogany's uh, testimony and Gary's testimony uh, that she was using profanity. You know, through Mahogany's testimony and Gary's testimony uh, that she did become physically the aggressor uh, in this action. So it's odd uh, that uh, Emily Waters, either she didn't see what was going on or she has an interest or maybe she's trying to help Tracy in some manner. But the most unusual thing is in her seven years as a police officer, and she wasn't a police officer that relates to this case, but in her seven years as a police officer, an investigating officer, in some hundred odd cases, she's never come across a situation where a victim who was unrelated to a witness contacted that person some days later. And contacted that person some days later, not to talk about the case, but just to confide just to confide in that person. Uh, in my experience, uh, and I'd asked each one of you during the selection process uh, if you could do one thing for me, uh, and that was uh, to use the common sense that you all brought into the courtroom with you uh, and, and ask yourself, uh, does it make sense uh, that uh, a complete stranger would call somebody and confide? And the interesting thing was when I asked Tracy why she did it, Tracy said she didn't know. She just called. She didn't know why. <clears throat> the reason I'm talking to you about these things is uh, we have to consider uh, these factors uh, in uh, looking uh, at the credibility and looking at uh, how ultimately you're going to uh, receive the evidence and the testimony and determine what the facts are in this particular case. As I had mentioned, you are in a position that each one of us are forced to put ourselves in the shoes of Gary Coleman at the time that this incident was taking place. Uh, there's no question that uh, Ms. Fields, uh, at some point, uh, you know, began to speak in a rude, uh, mean-spirited, uh, intentional manner. Uh, there's no question that some of the things that she was saying uh, towards Gary uh, were intended uh, to be hurtful. It's not uh, unreasonable to uh, realize that Gary uh, wanted to do 
something uh, because of her, her meanness. When he intentionally walked back to her uh, for the purpose of taking back the autograph, taking back something that she wanted, taking back something that he felt was valuable to her. There was no question that at some point she became angry. You can tell by the words that were being used back and forth to one another. You had an opportunity to see Gary uh, and Tracy Field standing next to each other uh, just before uh, we began to argue this case. Who do you think was intimidating who? Do you believe for one second that the diminutive stature of this person, Gary Coleman, sat there and beat on Tracy Fields like a punching bag without Tracy doing anything. Because if you don't believe that as I don't believe that, then the prosecution has nothing. But then, lo and behold, as the jury deliberated, a plea was negotiated. At about 4.45 p.m. Pacific time, Gary Coleman entered a no-contest plea to disturbing the peace. The judge would not allow our cameras to be turned on as Coleman officially entered the plea, but he did allow Court TV to record the sentencing that immediately followed. Um, the sentence will be as follows. Uh, 90 days in the county jail that is suspended. You placed on one year summary probation on the following terms and conditions. Pay a fine of $400 plus the penalty assessment. How long does he need to pay that? Uh, we have 60 days. Sure. Uh, you can have longer than that if you need it. Do you need longer than that? Sixty is okay. That's fine, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, Sixty days would be April five. Let's make that April eight. Okay. All right. Um, no bail laws do not commit the same or similar offense. <clears throat> Enroll in and complete fifty-two anger management classes. Show proof of your uh, completion of those classes on or before. Um, February 23 of the year 2000 or serve 60 days in the county jail. Um, there was one more condition that I omitted. Oh, yes. And stay away. F do, no, I can't order. Stay away. Do not annoy, molest, nor harass. Uh, Ms. Tracy Fields during the pendency of your probation. As you can tell, Gary Coleman was upset and he chose not to speak to us following the plea. But here's what the lawyers, Prosecutor Jeff Lewin and Defense Attorney Adam London, had to say. I think there was an opportunity for uh, both sides to uh, evaluate uh, what had happened in the case up to that point. And uh, I believe that it's a, a fair and uh, reasonable settlement. The prosecution had uh, offered uh, the ultimate uh, charge for which uh, the case settled was a lesser charge for that, uh, what was originally filed. And uh, it's a reasonable uh, disposition. He's okay, uh, other than the fact that uh, this is uh, something that uh, has been significant in his life for a while. He's very uh, happy that uh, the matter is, uh, is behind him and uh, there's closure to it a 415 of a disturbing the peace per versus a battery really no no real difference as far as I'm concerned as far as the civil suit is concerned there may be some issues but bottom line is he pled to the to the disturbing the peace he's got a charge on his record he has he's on probation he's got a stay away order so it's you know it's a it's a good it is really is a good resolution for both of us well, a good resolution, says the prosecutor. Defense attorney evidently happy. Gary Coleman upset, but presumably satisfied with the result, because without that he couldn't have entered into this plea. A year probation, 52 anger management classes. Right. That's sort of down your alley. Tell us what an anger management class is. Well, you see these typically with abusive spouses, uh, that that's part of their sentence if they are not put in jail. And probably it is the part of the plea which brought the two sides together 
uh, so that he could plead no contest to the disturbing of the peace. If that's normally done in the context of a spousal relationship or a marriage, then it implies that there's a continuing relationship and there's been evidence that this is not just a temper loss but a pattern of some kind. Why is it also appropriate with people at least about whom the system only knows of one outburst? It's possible in something like this where the outburst appears to be quite unprovoked. Uh, even though she insulted him, you're not supposed to run up at somebody and punch them in the eye. And when you look at the size difference between the two, which has been an issue throughout this trial, I think that they think uh, that they assess Gary Coleman needs to put a little cap on his temper because they don't want to be seeing him in their court well, again. Well, give me lesson one. How do I manage my anger? The number one thing you have to do is learn to walk away. And it's so hard. You have to watch the signals um, when people are pushing your buttons. And I think there is a big button that, that Tracy Fields put with Gary Coleman. Maybe he didn't even know that it existed. So it's a focus on self-awareness, that I, Raymond Brown, right. should learn what are the things that upset me and learn to recognize the signs when the steam is starting to build. That's right. And if you don't like autograph seekers, you stay away from autograph seekers. And when somebody asks for your autograph, you put a big red flag up and say, okay, this is one of those incidents. Got to walk away. Got to smile. And he's an actor. He should be able to act his way through that without punching people. Or maybe Gary can learn to wrestle with this issue of how he feels about his past as an actor and his current condition. Now, is there a lesson two or is that it? Because it sounds Sounds like th that's not a small task to say I should become aware of the things I'm sensitive to, how it is that I may react disproportionately or with anger where it's inappropriate, because sometimes it's okay to be angry. And if I can do all of that, it seems to me that's a huge leap. Or is there more to anger management than that in the context of the kinds of programs that people are assigned in the justice system? Well, the problem is that Gary Coleman has a very specific background. Not too many people who end up in anger management classes have a set of circumstances where they were a child actor for eight years, they, they had this. Um, uh, kidney problem. He's had two major surgeries. He is on constant dialysis. He's had uh, problems with his manager, his parents, civil suits in the past. He has a lot of things on his plate, which I think the ordinary person wouldn't have to deal with or manage. So his anger management has to be tailored to his particular background. And I think that he'll be successful if he's really committed to it. I don't know why this idea of anger management is intriguing. I mean, it's interesting. I wonder if it's more useful. Is it more useful with young, young folks? That is, is it better or more effective if you catch people, say, in their adolescent years uh, or uh, early young offenders than older folks in terms of how flexible we can be in learning about I'm, anger? I'm not sure that it's the age that really matters, although I would say that the older person is, it's a little bit more harder for them to change. The key is that they want to change. So the person who has hit rock bottom, who has bootstrapped him or herself and has decided to make some concrete changes in their life, that is the sort of person who will benefit most from the anger management. Right, maybe we could organize a class right here while we're on this break. And but I'm not angry then, with you yet. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> when we come back, we're going to be looking at a very interesting trial here at Court TV. A trial from Knoxville involving a man charged with four murders who's offered a very unusual defense. Stay with us. We'll be right back.